Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? Last week in Africa, welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. Uh, I am out somewhere hunting with the Hadza, being connected with the land, being a part of the remembering, and you know I am eating nose to tail. You know I am getting the unique nutrients found in organs. Uh, If you need more organs in your life, check us out at heartandsoil.co. We make, I believe, the finest grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised organs on the planet to get you nose to tail nutrition to help you reclaim your birthright to radical health. Um, I took beef organs and gut indigestion and histamine and immune with me to Africa, and it's been a godsend for sure. Uh, Histamine and immune has thymus with thymus and alpha-1 to help shore up your immune system. It's even been studied in COVID patients, as I talked about in my newsletter. If you're not getting it, you're missing out. And it's uh, heartandsoil.co to sign up for that newsletter. And I'm also super excited about immunomilk with the peptides, growth factors, and immunoglobulins for virus season. There's a lot of things going around now, coronavirus, flu, colds. These are really great ways to improve the health of your immune system. Immunomilk, histamine, and immune, you can use beef organs as your ultimate multivitamin just to get more organs in your diet. And I took gut and digestion because I wasn't sure what would be going on, what kind of things I would be experiencing in terms of bacteria or other weirdness in a new environment. And I wanted to at least have some stomach and tripe, uh, or excuse me, tripe and or stomach and intestines to support my gut uh, with that. So check us out, heartandsoil.co for nose to tail nutrition. <clears throat> and uh, you can always email me, Dr. Paul at heartandsoil.co. If you need que- help, if you have questions about which organ supplement might be right for you. So this week on the podcast, I wanted to take some time to recap my experience in Africa and to answer some of your questions. So this is kind of an Africa recap podcast. <clears throat> Africa recap podcast, excuse me. Uh, and uh, an AMA, an Ask Me Anything podcast. So I hope that it is enjoyable for you. It's been an incredible experience in Africa, as I describe on this podcast. And it's been really cool to be with these people in Africa, being a part of nature, being a part of the natural world, learning about so many things that they do, and trying to bring it back to my daily life and add value to your lives in uh, my explorations. So enjoy this podcast about Africa and ask me anything. Anthony Gustin, what's up, man? I'm Tana Bawa. Tana Bawa, cuckoo. <laughs> Tana cuckoo. It's good to have you here, man. I am sitting in a hotel in Costa Rica. You are sitting in a hotel in Miami. We are back from Africa. We had an amazing trip with the Hadza Hunter Gatherers. We also saw some Maasai and some Toga. We're going to unpack all of it in this podcast. This is probably going to be a part one. I cannot imagine that we're going to get through everything today, but we'll at least start and and kind of recap a bunch of the things we saw, things we thought about. Um, but I just wanted to start with my favorite quote from the podcast, which was not the podcast from our trip, which was you telling me that I had baboon brains in my beard <laughs> as we were sitting with the Hadza. <laughs> on a morning after a hunt. So that was my favorite quote. You got, you got baboon veins and brains in your beard. And I said, well, I'm just saving it for later. But any, any particular moment that stands out for you as just your favorite moment of the trip or your favorite quote? I mean, I think the hunt, the, the day we went hunting was this sort of encapsulation, encapsulation of all the things that, you know, you, you hear so much about hunter-gatherers. You know, I've theoretically understood so much stuff, but the experiential thing of going through and actually hunting for a full day, seeing them use sticks to light fires to smoke out a random hive of honey that they found. It's just like everything about it was, was amazing. And I think like that day of hunting for me was sort of the, the pinnacle. It, just, it felt like we kept hitting the jackpot over and over and over again. It was one of the coolest days of my life. And I think we said that to each other at the end of it. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what more could you ask for? I mean, it was like a, I don't know how long we were out 10, 11 hours to see them in their natural environment. And just to, to, I mean, I think we looked at each other like 15 times, like, can we believe we were just like in the middle of Africa hunting with hunter gatherers, like one of the last that exists currently successful hunts. I mean, it was like you and I were one of the very, very few people who saw this baboon just get pierced through the heart with a, with a knife as its neck is being torn apart by dogs. It's like, it's very vicious, very, very intense to, to do that, to, to then butcher it in front of us and cook it over an open fire to get the honey to see them. I like we were parched drinking tons of bottled water and scooping out this dry riverbed to try to find some, some water that percolates through the dirt. It's just like so much of this stuff was just mind blowing to me personally. So it was, it was awesome. It was so cool to have that real experience. And we really got to spend about five days with them. The hunt was the longest day that we spent in the quote bush. We'll talk about that in detail. I think I'm going to make a video that has all of this in it. So people can see that later on YouTube and, and we'll explain the hunt and what happened. And definitely we did kill a baboon. It was very intense. Something that our Western, uh, Western sentiments are not necessarily used to, but it's a daily part of their life and is part of their real sustenance and subsistence and is life and death for them. But I agree that day was incredible and we'll get into it more detail later on in this podcast. But let's just start at the beginning for you, why did you come on this trip? Other than the fact that your crazy friend, Paul was like, hey, do you wanna to come to Africa with me? I mean, what were your intentions around this? I think a lot of people were asking questions to me on social. What's the big deal with the Hadza? Why would you go halfway across the world to study these people? Why did you come on this trip with me? Yeah, I mean, I was super sick when I was growing up, really overweight. And it's been sort of like my life's mission to try to figure out why people are so sick and how to return them back to normal health. And I think that that just forces you down the rabbit hole of asking the question, what, like, what is health? How should humans be healthy? What does that look like? And like, where was the bifurcation where we became so sick? And through that, just have been enamored with hunter gatherers and how humans have co-evolved their environment and how we should be living for, you know, the last 15 plus years. I mean, getting the paleo diet 10 plus years ago and following all that stuff and just continuing to, to research and try to think about how, how should humans live. And this is a kind of once in a lifetime thing where I said, Hey, do you want to go to Africa? I said, fucking absolutely. This is a, <laughs> a dream of mine. And the Hadza in particular is, I mean, we were chatting before the recording of this paper that you brought up of some research regarding the last remaining hunter gatherer societies in the planet. And there was, I think five of them on the list, five. And Hadza is one of the, the um, so, so, so they like are in this, this rift um, of East Africa where it is thought that humans have evolved originally. And so you get not only one of the last hunter gatherer societies, but the ones who have most closely evolved and have been basically undisturbed for the last 50,000 plus years. I mean, it's just like an incredible wealth of wisdom in what it, what it means to really be a human. So of course, of course, there was an opportunity that I was going to take up. What about, I mean, what about you? Like, obviously this trip has morphed a lot from when we first started talking about it to when we went on it, but what, what were the main interests for you? So when I was writing my book, The Carnivore Code, I was envisioning a time machine. I kept coming up against this in my mental sort of explorations and my curiosities as I was writing this book. I kept saying in the book, if I only had a time machine, if I only had a time machine, I would go back 50,000 years or 100,000 years to see what Homo sapiens looked like and how we were living, either at the uh, co-occurrence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens in Northern Europe 50,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago in the East African Rift Valley. And for me, the Hadza are the closest thing that we have to a time machine. It doesn't completely work, it's not perfect. It's a DeLorean that runs on banana peels and Quaker instant oatmeal, but it's a time machine. And it's that's incredible because there's not many time machines left. And like you said, there's not many of these hunter gatherers that really live in any semblance of a hunter gatherer lifestyle left on the planet. There's probably about five. The, according to that paper, which I'll pull up later when we talk about it, the Hadza, the Ikung in uh, Namibia and Botswana, we wanted to go there, but we couldn't with COVID. The Ashe, who are in Paraguay, the Agata or Agta, who are in the Philippines, and then the Hiwi, um, which are in 
maybe Colombia and Venezuela. And many of them have also been acculturated to Western society. And so the Hadza were this culture that just has continued to fascinate me. The Hadza and the Kong, the Kong specifically, those Western cultures that still do legit hunter-gatherer, or so we were told, um, were the reason I wanted to go see this. And just like we talked about before the podcast coming on this, I think that a lot of people in the paleo space um, like to talk about these people, but how many in the paleo space or the animal-based space or the carnivore space or the keto space have actually gone and lived with them and spent time with them? And that kept coming up for me. I mean, I spoke about the Hadza a bunch when I was on Joe's podcast. There were a number of papers about the Hadza that were, that were really formative for me and my ideas. And we're going to talk about most of those today. And I kept thinking, well, I need to go visit them. I can't just read these papers. It feels disingenuous to just read a paper about a culture and not to go live with them. And the, the promise of being able to do the exact thing that we just described doing, spend 12 to 14 hours chasing these live, fast hunter-gatherers around the bush while they're shooting birds and stalking baboons and finding wild bush honey was a fantasy that you and I shared and it was amazing to actually do it. And now we've actually been there. We got in the freaking DeLorean, we put banana peels in the Cuisinart and we, we pretty much went back 30 to 40,000 years with a few glitches in the matrix. Yeah, and like we were talking about before the podcast as well, there's so much that gets lost in translation, but also parroted where one study says something that's inaccurate and everybody goes, oh, well, this is how it's been. And there's nothing like seeing the source of truth with your own eyes and actually experiencing it. And there is so much to be taken out of the little moments in between the big ones as well, of just living with them for five straight days and seeing in the downtime what was going on and digging up roots together with the, the, the women and the children. And then they're like, yeah, eat it right now. And it was just this hilarious moment where you, you looked at me and just started laughing and like, cause you, 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 these things look like really long, skinny, um, sweet potatoes. You peel off the, the skin then there's the white fleshy inner part. You chew on it. You put that in your mouth and you chew on it and you spit it out. And there's all these papers talking about the microbiome of the hods and how amazing they are. And I'm sure we'll get to that in a bit, but you looked at my hands and they were just filthy covered in dirt. They were like, Oh yeah. The, the fiber is what makes the, the microbiome, huh? The fiber. That's the, right. That's yeah. what everybody parrots. <laughs> yeah. The fiber that you just spit out on the ground. Yeah. And it's just like the observation, like, oh, duh. It's the, all the dirt that I'm shoving in my mouth, among many other things, of course. And then later on, we ate some poisonous berries. Too many of them will probably get to the story <laughs> as well. But I had a little bit of a tummy ache brewing. And like, oh, go dig up this root and eat it. So we go dig up these like really tiny, skinny roots from this plant, extremely bitter, but I was about to chew on them. And our guy, Gasper goes, oh, well, you, here, here's some water to wash all that dirt off. Like, no, Gasper, like this is, this is probably <laughs> the medicine was probably getting the microbes from the dirt and less the actual root of the plant. Uh, and there's like so many little things like that, that just being there, you, you have not have gotten from a research paper. You couldn't see all the details, all those little minutiae that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. The Hadza don't wash their hands because they don't have water. I mean, we can talk about it, but on one of the on one of the quote walkabouts that we went on, there was a little there was a little rain catchment inside a baobab. So the baobab is a tree that I'll show a photo of in a moment. That is really, I think it's called the tree of life in Africa because it has the baobab fruit, which is really cool. Both of us got to eat it. It's kind of like this almost like a, I don't know how to describe it, like a, like a candy, like a, like a cotton candy-ish, but not cotton candy type of uh, kind of a, a sponge, a sweet sponge flesh that surrounds the seeds, which are almost all the time spit out. Um, so the baobab has that fruit. The baobab that we walked by on the way to go dig roots had this rainwater catchment, this sort of gnarled root or gnarled, uh, you know, kind of protrusion that caught rainwater and there were these baobab pods literally sitting next to it, these cups that they've placed there next to their sink. And I was like, they were just drinking and they were like, hey, bawa, which is what they called us, which means man and aya means woman. They, they said, hey, you know, they were gesturing bawa, bawa, come over here and drink. And I went over and drank and you looked at me and said, well, if you get sick, then it was the rainwater in, in the baobab. And that became another running joke for us because sometimes we would do different things. And we thought, well, if you get sick, then it's the, it's the baobab, you know, water 
And if I get sick, then it's X, Y, or Z, right? So butchering the several hour old Jen and cat, Jen and cat, and not washing them. And yeah, that may, but, but our, uh, our observational research suggests that that maybe wasn't something that got you sick. But anyway, this, <laughs> this baobab tree also has a water catchment for them. And then we later found honey in a baobab tree, which was incredible. So this, this tree is just such a source of nutrition and resources for them. And, and some were hollowed out for actual dwellings. Yeah, yeah. And so we were, we were walking by this on the way to dig tubers and here's this incredible experience. These, these little details that you would experience with them but can never be communicated in a paper or a book. These are the things that we were actually able to really immerse ourselves in. And, and that was such a valuable experience. But the Hadza don't have, they don't have running water. Uh, there's there are streams that are far away, and there was a river that we crossed on the way there, which would look like the chocolate river out of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> it looked so full of mud, but they, they have resources and they don't worry about not having water. But they're certainly not washing their hands, and they are getting tons of microbes from the dirt. And we'll get into this a little later in our more detailed conversation about fiber. But they're also spitting out the majority of the fiber they're taking in. And so here is Justin Sonnenberg and other people parroting this notion over and over. The Hadza have this very diverse, high alpha diversity microbiome. Of course, it's because they're eating 100 grams of fiber a day. But there's no way they're eating 100 grams of fiber a day, at least not in the rainy season when we went. So those are the type of things that are so valuable for us yeah. to experience. And again, we're in a time capsule that is not perfect. And we only went in a very specific time of the year. So I, I try not to overgeneralize our observations and say, like, this is what it always is but there's so many things broken and so many of the other observations that I've read around. They also eat 40, 50, 60 plus different types of plants primarily. It's like, absolutely not. Like, <laughs> first of all, there's just not enough of, there's not enough plants varieties that are edible that don't have thorns on them in East Africa. It is an intense place. The plants there do not want to be eaten, period. Occasionally, they might put out fruit, which the Hadza appear to be more adapted to than us. We think that's what made us say, <laughs> don't eat the bush berries was the, uh, was the refrain at the end of the, of the trip when Anthony and I, so the whole story here is that we, on the fourth day or the third day, we, were, we had packed in three of the Hadza into our Jeep, which was a hilarious experience. Um, and we drove them, apparently the guides do this sometime to a far away location, maybe 20 kilometers, um, an old camp of theirs on the shores of Lake Yasi. And at this old camp, there are a lot of these elephant foot plants, which they, which they use to make arrow poison. And so we had all of these Hadza, three guys in the, in the back seat of the Jeep, and then he and I are in the front seat, just laughing at this, this hilarity of this instance, this moment in time. And we're driving down the road and they start freaking out and they're saying, oh, there's those berries on the side of the road. We got to stop on the way back and eat them. And you and I look at each other and we're like, heck yeah, let's do it. We're going to stop with these Hadza guys and eat these berries on the, on the way back. And so we, you know, we make this poison with them, which you're not supposed to get in your bloodstream or it'll kill you. Um, and you definitely don't want to eat it. And you have to wash your hands really well after you make it. And then on the way back, they stop on the side of the road and these guys literally sprint out of the truck. They are like climbing over us to get out of the truck, these berries. And you and I are like, great, let's do it. So we went ham on these berries and probably paid for it later. Well, the funny part is they split off after a couple of minutes, started cutting down branches and tying on the top of the Jeep. And then like five minutes later, after you and I just kept eating them and kept eating them, they liked over like, come on, let's go. <laughs> like we were the ones that had to be pulled off the berries. And this is kind of an interesting observation. Compar like comparatively, they also had the water that you're talking about from the baobab. It's not like they were there drinking the whole fucking thing, like, like all of the water. They just have a little bit of, of things when they find it. And the baobab, like we asked to knock down the baobab right off their camp to try it. They have an abundance of baobab, but they don't eat all the baobab. They don't drink all of the water. They don't eat all the berries. We, we programmed as Westerners like, oh, we have to eat all of these now or we'll never be able to have any more again. And it's like the, the stickiness of these things these berries were, were so dense that you could barely even spit out the seed. And so I started just swallowing the seeds because that's what they said to do. And I think that that's what got us. Whereas our guides the next day were like, 
oh yeah, you weren't supposed to eat as many of those berries as you did. The Hadza can barely even eat that many. Um, I thought so that was let's, let's learned. Yeah, that was that was a strange moment for me on the trip when you had gotten GI distress that night. It hit me the next morning while I was hunting for honey with the Hadza. And I look over at one of our guides and he goes, I don't think it was the meat because I'm sure everyone listening to this is going to say, you ate, you ate baboon and Jenna cat. That's what got you sick. And I don't think so. And he didn't think so either. He said it was probably those berries. The Hadza are adapted to them and they're very sticky and they have that kind of syrupy stickiness. It was the stickiest inside of a berry I'd ever, I'd ever experienced. Like you said, you could barely spit out the seed. It was so sticky. He said, that's probably what made you sick. And I thought, you didn't tell me this yesterday when Anthony and I are, are absolutely gorging ourselves on these berries. And oh my God, like you could have warned me. Anyway, let yeah, me learn. Jonas, Gasper, and Gorgio all said separately that it's probably the berries. That's... I've never seen anybody get sick off of the meat there ever. So Ga Gasper is, was our main guide. He's been going there since 2005. And he said he's never once seen anybody get sick after eating the meat. Not Bush meat. Yeah. 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 I wonder how many people he's taken that ate baboon brains, which is something else we'll address in a moment. But I want to show people with a screen share where we actually were for, um, for geog geographic placement here. Um, so we flew into Kilimanjaro National Airport or International Airport, which is up here. We then took a, uh, we then drove to Arusha and then did a couple of days looking at these um, conservation areas, Ngoro Ngoro right here and another one over here called Lake Iasi, which is further to the south. And then most of the time we spent was here, excuse me, Lake Manyara, which is right here. And then we spent the majority of our time by Lake Iasi. This is where the Hadza live, just south of Lake Iasi. And one of the more striking things that I noticed, Anthony, and we both took pictures of uh, a graphic in a book that was at one of the lodges we stayed at that showed the region of land where the Hadza used to live and the region of land where they live now. So historically, the Hadza probably lived all through this area, all through, we know they did because of Oldapai Gorge, which we'll talk about in a moment, and Goro and Goro, which is probably, probably somewhere they have lived as well. But they had a huge amount of land for a small amount of hunter-gatherers, and now they're limited to a very small strip of land south of Lake Iasi, that was one of the more striking things for me that their hunting grounds have been massively constrained. Yeah, and I think like the most interesting thing about this whole journey that we went on is we, we like you said, we made our way west, stopped at Lake Manyara, saw Ngoro, Ngoro um, conservation area. And when we, especially Lake Manyara was, was really fascinating just to drive through and see all of the large game I mean, it was like a movie where the, it was, you know, we saw a lion sleeping on the side of the road, elephants coming straight at our, at our Jeep, giraffes, zebras, you name it, water buffalo. But then we went to Angora Angora, which is this 10 kilometer, I think is, was, is the um, diameter of this crater. Might be a little bigger, but yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's like, it's, a, it's huge. So all, it's this caldera, this old volcano we drive in and it is the closest thing to the Lion King that I think I will ever see in my life. It's insane. There's any direction you look, there are hundreds, hundreds of any species all sort of mingled within each other. There are lions lying next to antelope and just sitting, like everything's coexisting. And it's just this absolute cornucopia of life in large game. Um, grazing and just no stress, complete abundance. And then we go to Lake Yasi region and we go and hunt a couple days later. And the contrast to being in Lake Manyara and in Gorongoro where you could throw a rock and hit a large animal to having to hike 10 hours to go get one baboon to bring him back to camp is striking. Like we now, like it is very clear to know where that bubble, like you said, used to be for these people and where it is now and how brutal it is. Like the, one of the main questions is why do you have to hunt baboons? Why can't they have large game? And this is, this is the answer. Their geographical region where they can be has been from the government constricted to this tiny area south of Lake, Lake Yasi. But on top of that, the Datoga, Iraq and other tribes in the area are now farming quite a lot. They're doing monocrops of corn. They have cattle and goats, et cetera that have surrounded them entirely. So any wildlife that would have naturally been in that area. Uh, what, I mean, what were the antelope called? The 
Uh, the Eland. The Eland. Or there's or like Eland. The, gi giant, like Neil Guy, sort of like huge antelope that used to be there quite a lot. Um, and like all these other large game are now basically being, being pushed out by all the farmers. And now the, the Hadza are condensed in this tiny little area. And when we went hunting, we had to walk through and around, I don't know, dozens of different farms, which apparently shouldn't, shouldn't be the case, but the Zatoga are encroaching in their, on their land. And nobody's uh, doing anything about it. Yeah. And so, yes, it was amazing to see this, but it was this, this sort of really depressing when it comes down to it, seeing the contrast between Gora Gora, these conservation areas of what it should be like versus what it is like now in modern day for them. So yeah, I mean, the, the contrast was, was striking. So I, I tried to download some photos. I didn't get quite as many as I hoped for, but you guys can see this is a picture of Ngoro Ngoro Crater. And this was a common sight. We're in the Jeep on the side of the road. There are water buffalo in this picture, zebra, probably an eland out there. There are literally hundreds of animals in the frame. And if I panned my camera, you might see elephants to the right. We saw hyena, we saw jackal. We saw so much stuff in Ngoro Ngoro. It was, it was literally the Garden of Eden, um, for lack of a better characterization. It felt like Jurassic Park. There were lions on the side of the road. On the way into Ngoro Ngoro, three lionesses just walked across the road in front of our Jeep. And, you know, make that in stark contrast to the scene when we're out hunting with the Hadza, um, this is the bush outside of their camp. This is a bunch of the tribes men. Here's a gentleman holding up a, a small bird that he's killed. And he's, he's holding it up, uh, you know, pridefully because the arrow shot that it took to get this in, used an incredible amount of skill. But th this is a small bird. This is maybe four ounces of meat, six ounces of meat total. And you, you can't see it in this photo, but maybe over here in the background somewhere, there's a Datoga farm. And nobody's in there saying to the Toga, hey, this is the Hadza land. You can't farm here. A lot of this land is very fertile. And so people are moving in to farm all sorts of things, onions and corn and, um, you know, uh, all sorts of other crops that they also farm. And if you guys have ever, ever spent any time in the United States in a wilderness area, you know that you can't have, you can't have motorized vehicles in a wilderness area. You can't have dogs in a wilderness area. You can't have, you're not supposed to have a lot of people or things that make a lot of noise because it scares the animals off. And so it's no surprise that when we asked the Hadza, they invariably said, and Frank Marlowe in his book, you know, reiterates the exact same notion that all the Hadza that he's talked to say that within the last three to four generations, so within the last 40 to 80 years, the amount of meat that they can hunt is severely decreased and, and massively limited because of all this encroachment on their lands hunting wild animals that are big takes a lot of land. These animals need land to roam. They used to hunt elephants. They don't do this anymore. They used to hunt much bigger animals and you just can't do it anymore. We heard stories from our guide that 15 years ago when he would go to see the Hadza, they would literally walk 15 minutes out of camp and kill an impala, uh, you know, 100 to 200 to 300 pound animal or walk 30 minutes out of camp and kill an eland, which is a thousand kilogram animal. It's like the size of a, it's like a cow plus a, plus an antelope. It's the biggest antelope you've ever seen. And the Hadza all said that was their favorite food was an eland, probably because of the size, but they just can't get large game anymore because their lands have been so severely limited. So that leaves them to have to hunt small birds, baboons, and probably increases their reliance on a lot of these plant foods they're gathering. It's, it's really tragic. Yeah. I mean, if they had a choice to be where they are right now, or to be able to be in Gorongora Crater with those animals, you know what they would choose. Like everything we asked them about, be it from their dreams to what they care about, to what they're excited about in life, goes towards getting the big kill, getting the big game kill. It's what they dream about. It's what they talk about. It's their biggest party. It's the best day of their life. It's what makes them most fulfilled, happiest. So why would they not choose to be there, which is an area that they have historically inhabited, inhabited. So, I mean, this, this is like the, the most tragic thing to me is see them, see their numbers dwindle and their lifestyle change due to the encroachment of Western civilization. And at the end of the podcast, you and I will spend some time thinking about this and sharing with people some of our preliminary ideas about how to protect them or at least enable them to continue to be, quote, wild. But one of the things that we want to do is bring people back to Lake Yossi, bring people back to Hadza land and create some sort of a fund with the proceeds from those trips to either buy the land from the Datoga 
or create a conservation area or somehow protect their land. The goal being to get the wild animals back in there for them, because as we've said, this is a, they're a very valuable window into the way that humans have lived for thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps millions of years. Yeah, and I think that what's important also to address before we even go further is I can already hear some people be like, well, you idiots, you're, you're contributing to them with this tourism that you're, you're putting forth. And Eric Edmeads, who huge hat set to him, who has helped us organize this in the beginning, um, said that they actually were on the verge of being wiped out completely from the government, you know, 15, 20 years ago until they saw that, oh, tourism could help bring in some money. So let's preserve an area for them south of Lake Yassi. So without tourism, they would have been wiped out completely by now. And so I think that if that's the case, like we could use tourism to help, you know, shine a light on some of the ways that humans should be living and obviously preserve this, but also help them. They don't want to be farmers. They don't want to transition to a, a more civilized way of life, quote unquote. And when we asked them this and they said, why the hell would I, would I go somewhere and depend on the rain and have the rain miss a season and thus starve? Why would I go where somebody tells me what to do all the time? These people want to live like this. And tourism is the best way to preserve their way of living, unfortunately. That's a great point. I really appreciate you bringing that up, that they would be gone because I don't know how to put this gently. I'm not sure the government of Tanzania really gives a rat's ass about the Hadza, to tell you the truth, perhaps. But when you create a financial incentive around the Hadza, they're much more likely to stand up and take notice. I mean, the reason I'm saying that is that you can look at precedents from governments around the world not preserving indigenous hunter-gatherer groups. It's, it's happened repeatedly. And I am nearly sure that their lands would have been completely usurped had they not been a valuable resource in one way or another. And so I think that the answer might be more tourism done properly. Um, not as much an ecotourism, but perhaps just encouraging people to see them in the right way or encouraging people to hunt with them or actually to walk with them and go for hikes with them and not just to come into their camp and, you know, create an environment where they just want to do a fake song and dance because there's a lot of that in Africa, unfortunately. I think a lot of these cultures find benefit from tourism, which is great, but then they create these kind of song and dance shows for people that don't really represent the way they're living. And one of the cool things about the Hadza and one of the cool things about spending five days with them was that I think you and I can both confidently say this is absolutely how they live. Mm. This is this is their real life. They have certainly made some song and dance for tourists, but they live this day in and day out. And we can talk about our disappointments later on in the podcast and the ways that they've been westernized um, and the way their culture is being eroded. But we saw we hung around the fire with them for hours and hours and hours every day. There was nothing on the agenda. We just sat in those caves with them or sat around the fire in under the baobab tree in their camp and just just hung out with them. And that was one of the coolest things. And they live this. And like you said, another really important part of the trip for me was sitting down with our translators, which was uniquely challenging at times, and asking them questions. And so I wanted to go through a few of the questions that we asked them, because you had some people on your Instagram that asked questions to you. People asked me some questions, and we brought some questions to the Hadza. And I want to go through some of those questions so that people know we asked them these things and what they responded to. So you already briefly touched on a few of these. Some of the more important questions for me were, what foods do you prefer? Um, because I'm very interested in this one paper that talks about uh, tubers as fallback foods for the Hadza. And I wanted to sort of confirm that in my own mind. <laughs> so this is a paper that I had, I've spoken about repeatedly. It's a paper that I brought up on Rogan. And basically this paper is by Frank Marlowe, the guy that wrote, quote, the book on the Hadza. And you can see here that he does describe their, their foods are fairly limited. Um, as you suggested, there is a lot of parroting around the notion that they eat only, that they eat 60 species of plants, which we did not see to be the case. But you can see here, they eat probably four or five species of tubers, five species of berries. They eat a number of different meats and they eat baobab and honey. That's the majority of their diet. That's pretty much what we observed. And then they, they, they ask the men and the women to rate what their favorite foods were. Now, the answers we got were a little different than what Frank Marlowe got in the 1990s and early 2000s when he did his PhD research. Like you said, invariably, they talked about meat. Meat is, their, their culture is centered on meat and organs. They always eat nose to tail. I want to make that very clear. 
We ate baboon liver. We ate genet cat liver. We ate goat liver. We ate everything that we ate, we ate the liver with them and they use the liver as an apeme meat, E-P-E-M-E, -E -E, like a sacred meat, along with the tenderloin and the tender cuts and the other organs. But meat was the center of their culture. And so when we asked them, what are your favorite foods? They said, eland, baboon, and um, bush pig. And, and then the conversation just went deeper and deeper into meat, as you suggested. They said, we asked them, what do you dream about? They said, hunting. What's the best day of your life? bringing back the biggest game for the tribe. What makes a good husband? Someone that is a successful hunter and brings meat to the tribe. Uh, you know, what, you know, it, it was all about meat. You know, what do you do when you're not hunting? They make arrows and they talk about hunting. It was, it was all about meat. They're an incredibly meat centric society. And for good reason, because I believe, and this is one of the reasons or one of the hypotheses that I had going there, that meat was really, and, and by meat, I mean meat and organs, were really the central foods for humans for the last few million years of our life and were the difference between us as bonobos and chimpanzees and us as australopithecines, us as Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and eventually Homo sapiens. And it sounds like that was your sense as well, that, that they're, they're basically meat-centric. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we ate every single part of the animal. We ate the skin off of the baboon's face we ate the, the brains. We like, I mean, it's just like interesting to see them do the same thing with every single animal that they got, which was usually splayed up and cut the entrails out, give them to the dogs was the first step. Meaning Second like step the was, intestines. Yes. Not the, the stomach. Correct. The, the next step was to basically immediately throw the rest of the organs straight under the fire, just straight under the coals. And then after a couple of minutes, they took that off and chopped them all up put everything else either directly on the fire or on sticks on the fire and then ate the, the, the muscle meat last. Mm -hmm. And then after that, like, I guess it wasn't last, the, the last thing they would do is take all the little bits, bone, skull, everything, and they would scrape every single little piece off, crush the bone, suck the marrow out, every joint surface, and anything that basically would, it, would have gone past and broke their teeth had they tried to do more, they gave to the dogs. So it, it, very clear, um, preference for animal foods for sure. And that, that was really interesting for me to see, not surprising, um, but very interesting. And I remember you and I sitting behind one of the 10 year olds in the group, we're, just, we're calling him 10 years old. He looked about 10 years old. He was one of the characters. I got to go hunting for honey with him one morning, but we were just kind of looking at each other with disbelief and awe as he was just taking every little piece of cartilage off what must have been a goat femur or something, and then breaking the bone in half and sucking the marrow. And we thought, yeah, they actually do this. And there, there is a quote that has been circulated in carnivore circles or sort of animal-based circles from Willemar Stephenson with the Inuit. And though Willemar Stephenson has described in Fat of the Land and Not by Bread Alone, um, which actually might be the same book titled differently, there's Hunters of the Great Wide North, he wrote as well, that they always favored the organs, they gave the kidneys to the children, they loved the liver. But there's one quote that sometimes people in carnivore circles will share saying they gave the organs to the dogs. And I thought that never makes sense. And we did not see that with the Hadza. They, and I imagine that doesn't happen with the Inuit either. I suspect that what was playing out with the Inuit was exactly what we see with the Hadza, which was the guts. So anything where the poop is, that goes to the dogs and the rest goes to humans, including the stomach, the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the eyeballs, the brains, and all the tendons and connective tissue, which is why I believe it's so important to get organs in our diets and why we do what we do at Heart and Soil, et cetera, with these desiccated organ supplements for people who can't get these normally. But it was really cool to see it. And, and I felt so privileged that they, they shared those critical apeme foods with us. That meant that we were apeme males, which is apparently, according to Frank Marlowe and other anthropologists who have spent um, even longer amounts of time with them, kind of about this a status within the tribe. And I'll never forget when they got this goat. So one day, I think as a gift to them, we brought them a goat from some re local Maasai herders. And when they cut the liver out, um, one of the guys literally just, it was so cool to see. He just gingerly mm. had the liver and he placed it on a rock and they were just like saving it. It was clearly very specially <laughs> regarded. Did you see him do that? Yeah. Yeah. And then they cut it up and cooked it and saved it for us and, and distributed it. But the organs are eaten, guys. Nose to tail with these guys. And then like we said, we're back full circle now, baboon brains in my beard. 
Anthony usually stays more clean shaven because he's so professional like that. But, um, but baboon brains, what did you think of baboon brains, man? I thought they were great. I mean, it wasn't my first time eating brains, so no stranger there, but yeah, it was, I mean, that was when I felt like we had dissimulated a little bit more than just the typical song and dances. There was the day after the hunt I think that you and I, Eric as well, he, he sort of split off to a different try, uh, like different um, sect of the hunt, but you and I specifically like intentionally kept up and were running with them when they were running, which was like, we would walk for 10 plus miles and then out of nowhere, just a snap of the fingers. They just are sprinting without breathing heavily, without sweating anything. Um, and we did our best to keep up. I think we earned some respect that day. And so you and I came the next day, sat down in the morning and the guy who had hunted the baboon was sharing the, you know, the, the cheek muscles, the neck, the skin, everything, um, the tongue smashed open the ox put and then used a little bit of a stick to, to feed us some of the brains, which were like sort of like scrambled eggs is the, but like really rich. It was like a mix between like a, a pate and scrambled eggs, warm, uh, in incredible. And then I think that you share this with some people and they're like, you can get prions. You're gonna you're like you, you, you fucking crazy, um, <laughs> and so I think you looked into that, and I, I don't think there's much to worry about. Yeah, I looked into that in detail because people were worried about it. So I sent, I sent, and um, I'm gonna let people know that some of the images that will follow here are um, are a little bit graphic. So you may not, if you if you if you're sensitive to graphic images, I'll warn people at this point. Um, if you like graphic images and you want to see how humans live for real, then you can go to the YouTube video and see this stuff. But I sent um, a video like this to Joe Rogan and he said, dude, that's heavy. And then I told him, you know, we ate the brains the next day. You can see this is the guy that hunted the baboon. This is the baboon. And, um, and he said, can't you get prions from the baboon brain? And my first thought was, if I get prions from living with the Hadza, so be it. And my second thought was maybe I should do a little research and, and figure out what my risk is <laughs> so I can inform my family if I'm going to be drooling mess, you know, in six months or a year. And it, as it turns out, uh, my suspicions were right, that there are no documented cases of prions. And prions are a protein particle. For people who are curious about this, there's a disease in humans called crutchfeld jakob disease that causes spongiform encephalopathy in the brain. It's kind of it gives these little bubbles in the brain. And we don't even actually know what causes it. The majority of cases are felt to be sporadic. This was the whole scare with bovine, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, mad cow disease, that there was concern that a prion disease in cows in Europe, in the UK specifically, um, was moving from meat to humans. And there may have been a few cases of that. Now that's very rare and it's not been documented in other species that I'm aware of. There is a um, there is a disease called Kuru, which happens in some African villages, but Kuru happens when there is this ritualistic process of eating the dead. So they're eating humans in, mm -hmm. in these tribes as part of the burial ritual, kind of, I think that they believe that they can take on the spirit of the human, or it's some, some respect practice to actually eat the human. And what is believed to have happened originally with Kuru was someone in the tribe died from sporadic crutchfeld jakob disease, which is again is a, a random occurrence of this prion disease in humans. We don't know why it happens. And they ate that person's brain. And then they got Kuru. Kuru, as far as I could tell from my research, did not happen from eating monkeys. And there's no documented incidences of any prion diseases moving from baboons to humans. So I'm safe, you guys. Although if the content deteriorates in quality in the next year for both Anthony and I, you'll know what's happened. And, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll be... Uh, We'll, we'll be good. So yeah, and, and from what I understand, the same thing happened with with mad cow disease, where it was parts of ground up cows who also had this were being fed to other cows, and it's more of a species to species thing. And yes, it's happening chronic wasting disease in, in deer. deer in the U.S., but jumping from species to species is actually quite rare. Um, and it's just like it was also baffling when I first posted these photos in in about us hunting the baboon of how many people thought and still think just in general that meat is bad like not bad from a health perspective but dangerous to eat like the separation from humans in nature from the cleanliness of meat is just striking to me whenever i post up whenever i post up stuff and like you were an example of this when you brought liver 
<laughs> and I even asked you several times, I'm like, are you sure this is good to eat? And I was an example of what the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, you took liver with you in this trip, just kept it in a jar. I'm like, isn't that going to go bad? Or, or you're like, no, it's, it's totally fine. And I think that there's so many misconceptions about bush meat, wild meat, et cetera, being unsafe for human consumption that just propagate these myths over and over and over again. Yeah. And I think that it's, I mean, I'm just going to say it and be blunt about it. I think that as Westerners, we're weak. Uh, we're kind of pansies and we have weak sentiments around actually killing and eating animals respectfully. We have weak sentiments around blood. Whenever I post photos of me with blood on my hands, actually butchering a deer that I respectfully and gratefully harvested at Rome Ranch, people unfollow me in droves. And I think, wow, there's a bunch this of is really- the, This is the carnivore MD as well. <laughs> it's carnivore MD. Yeah, we're weak-willed humans and we're just, we're very scared about bacteria and viruses. And that's exactly my thinking around the, the baboon brain is, you're damn right I'm going to eat it. And if it had caused me to get massively sick, I still would have been happy that I ate it. I wanted to experience, I wanted to ride in the freaking DeLorean, man. I want the damn time machine. I don't want the time machine through a window. I don't want to go to a zoo. And I'm not saying that we're seeing these people as like zoo animals. I'm just saying like, I wanted to be in this experience. I'm glad we got diarrhea from the berries or whatever the heck we got diarrhea from because I would not have traded a minute of it. And I'm happy that I ate the baboon brains. They were delicious. The Hadza look like they're doing just fine. They eat baboon brains all the freaking time. And like I said, um, I wasn't aware of any diseases when it happened. And then I did more research and it's just people being afraid of things they don't understand. And I got so many comments like, you're gonna get prion diseases and no, you're not. And people say the same thing when I eat deer brains. I hunted down in San Antonio recently and I ate brains right out of a deer's head because I really want to understand what it is to be a human. And I think these are things we've always done. now. Eating deer brains, people might say that's a little more risky. There's never been a documented case of chronic wasting disease jumping from deer to humans. This deer looked very healthy. And let's just know, let's just mention that at least in the deer populations, chronic wasting disease appears to be proliferating because the predators have been eliminated because natural ecosystems have been disrupted. And when animals over proliferate, the animals that are sick or that develop this chronic wasting disease are allowed to continue to proliferate. And so what we need is more predators to control these deer. We need these deer to be hunted and um, the reason that it's persisting or proliferating these populations is because the natural predators have been eliminated because we're scared as humans, basically. Yeah, and I think like another point is just the ethical nature of hunting. Wouldn't you want more nutrition out of each kill if you're going to make that argument that exactly? Yeah, you know, like shouldn't you spread the nourishment across? I mean, I don't think there's anything as such as waste in nature, anyways. And I think if you would have thrown the brains out, bugs and everything would have else would have eaten it. But if you're going to be the predator eating it just like the Hadza, why wouldn't you extract as much nutrition out of that one kill as, as humanly possible? And that's exactly what they do. And so as Anthony mentioned, to, to sort of ensure that I had some good organ nutrition, I didn't know we were gonna be as fruitful in our hunts with the Hadza or as lucky as we were to eat these organs with them. I brought, um, I brought two sets of things. I brought a bunch of supplements from hardened soil. I brought desiccated organ supplements and I brought liver in a jar. And the liver in a jar <laughs> turned into high liver because there's no refrigeration. And I just thought, well, here we go. I'm gonna, I've never really had high liver before, but I ate it throughout the trip. And um, our, our, <laughs> our gracious uh, organizer, Eric at Meads, again, hat tip to him, uh, was just totally grossed out by it. But I did fine. Like I did not get sick from eating fermented liver, room temperature fermented for 10 days, no problem. I think I ate the last of the liver on the day that I left Africa, or at least the day that I was in Arusha, so it was 10 or 12 days into our trip, it was pretty highly fermented and I was fine. You guys, it was gnarly. It was, it was disgusting. <laughs> it was green and slimy. It wasn't and, green. Yes, it was. <laughs> I have photos of it. I can, I mean, I'll, I'll share photos of it. Um, I, I usually go with uh, my nose on these things. And like nose is the first barrier defense, taste is the second. Um, so if something smells disgusting to me, I trust my innate human wisdom to be like, okay, this is something that I shouldn't be eating. <laughs> and then if I put it in my mouth and it tastes rotten, especially with plant foods, I always do this, I just spit it out. I get it. And this is actually something, to so jump in real quick before we get back to maybe even the questions that we asked the Hadza, but the, I was eating way more fruit than I normally did or have historically in the last couple of years when we were there. It was all very fresh, especially when, when I went to Zanzibar and we were closer to Mount Kilimanjaro than Lake Yassi. Fruit was just far more plentiful and abundant in that area. Felt great. My blood sugar was stable when I wasn't eating the fruit. Actually, it was going down day over day. And 
it's like I had this intuition from my body, like, oh, this is delicious. So I'm going to keep eating it because it's nourishing me. I got some fruit here when I got back from Whole Foods. It, it, this is not food. It does not taste like food. This whole thing about smell and taste <laughs> and it sort of leading you down the, the right path. I'm eating a mango here, a banana or anything else here. I'm like, I want to spit it out. Like this does not taste like actual food. And it's just striking to me of, I, I mean, I think that there's so much around, I think the need for humans to eat local and eat the foods that the land around them provides. And it's very clear that, uh, you know, maybe some stuff can be grown here in Florida where I am currently, but it's not. This stuff in Whole Foods is being trucked and planed in from the rest of the world, unripe, grown in mass quantities. Like, this is not food. It, 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 it's, it's so, like, it's just sort of a reflection of where this goes from this departure from the Hadza of their environment is being so restricted where they can't even eat real food anymore. And they have to go to eat this one little source of protein with, from a baboon many, many miles away from their camp. And now he, the best we can do in the Western world is get our food delivered many, many, many miles away. And I can't just go outside and, and get a fish. I can't get, you know, I can't hunt out here. I can't, I have to go to the store to go. It's provided for me there. And it's not even food let alone the 99% of the actual food-like substances in the grocery store, just complete trash in the package. And it's just shocking. I'm like, I was looking around and this is the first time I was in a grocery store since we were with the Hadza. And I was looking around, like turning in 360 degrees, thinking, what is edible here? Like, what is edible? Even looking at the meat counter, I'm like, this looks pathetic. This looks disgusting. And I, it's one of these things where I think I'm just probably going to be ruined for a while and having to subsist only on my little homestead that I create back in Texas whenever I can go back home. But yeah, I mean, it's just, this is where it goes. Like the pe people go to a grocery store, it's like, wow, what, what an amazing thing that we have abundance for. And like, we, we get to have all this food for little energy and we can go get whatever we want at any given time. But when whatever you can get is not actually real food that has grown near you, is that a good thing? Yes, we can survive, but are we thriving? And we're setting up ourselves in a, in a situation where we can't, we can't actually obtain the foods easily that are local to this area, period. And that creates, and this is something that you and I talked about a lot on this trip. I think that creates an inevitable undercurrent of scarcity mindset in humans. You and I are both not in Austin right now because of a massive winter storm. Power's out, water's out, grocery stores are empty. This is a perfect illustration of what you're talking about. Humans, and we'll have maybe more conversation at the end of this podcast or a future podcast about how we take what we've learned from the Hadza and bring it back into our 2021, quote, modern civilization. We obviously can't all go back to living as hunter-gatherers, but they do highlight many of these ideas that when the Hadza got things, they were not gorging on them. They knew they had abundance. It's, I think it, it's such an abundance mindset just in the, their ability to make fire. They don't carry around matches or lighters most of the time. We actually did see them with matches one time and I think they tried to hide it from us when they did it while they were smoking on the trail. Yeah, to, to, but, light, to light their yeah, to light tobacco. A cigarette. And we, yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the vestiges of Western civilization that has inevitably uh, sullied them. But uh, the majority of the time they made fire with a stick. They made fire with a drill, a hand drill, and ember, which they put, and we saw it multiple times. Within two minutes, they could have fire anywhere, anytime, anyhow. We saw it when they made poison. We saw it when they cooked this baboon. We saw it when they wanted to smoke bees out of a hive. They have so much abundance. They have so much natural ability to make fire, to be safe in their environment, to take shelter, to build shelter, to hunt animals when they want. And of course, their, their hunting grounds are limited, but there's an abundance there. They don't they don't really, I think, feel as though they're wanting for much. I think they would like bigger animals to hunt, but, and here humans, we've created this artificial environment where one fickle stroke of mother nature's hand can bring our home city to its knees. It's crippled Austin because- Millions of, of people. Yeah, Millions it's really people. tragic. Uh, I, I have a question when we, so we stayed, we did not stay with them. You can't stay with them anymore. I don't exactly know why Eric just said that. I think the government is not allowing that anymore. So we, don't, we weren't staying at the actual camp with them. We were staying maybe 30, 40 minutes away at this pretty nice lodge. It's actually shocked at how nice it was on Lake Yassi. And there we had you know, breakfast and dinner that we could have, great meals, meat and fruit, basically was what we were eating. People were, 
people were asking me, like, do you feel bad that you're going somewhere else and having abundant food and all this different stuff? And my answer was absolutely not. Because these people are not struggling, even though, and I think it's important to highlight that the fact that they do need to depend a little bit because of their reduction in large game that they can hunt. They are depending a little bit more on ugali, which is a cornmeal porridge that's made from corn ground by stone, stones usually provided by missionaries. So even though they're eating some of this, again, there is not a scarcity mindset, complete abundance mindset. They have baobab, they have roots and tubers, they can go hunt. And it's not like they are struggling. This is a very different thing from, I think, what most people think of as impoverished Africa, which happens when people start subsisting in agriculture, when people then abstract their ability to provide themselves with food and rely on the environment around them. And I mean, it was just like, it was amazing to see them with a knife to be able to make whatever they wanted with an environment around them. It's like tools as well. It's like, okay, we need to make a fire. We know exactly which branch from, from which plant can make a fire. We need to make a spatula to mix poison in a, in a pot. I'm exactly going to do that right now. We need to make a, this thing to smash the poison. And I know how to make that. And I know how to hunt. I know how to do whatever. We, we saw a guy, we, we gave him a couple of bottles of water that you filtered out of this, this murky stuff. And he was carrying it. And then he just immediately grabbed this piece of a, uh, of a twig and created this rope like thing and tied the bottles up, threw them around his shoulders. Like the, the ingenuity that people have because of their knowledge of how to live in their environment and provide for themselves, I think leads to so much lack of stress and so much ability to just be present and live and be happy. These people are not struggling by any means. They're, they're mm-hmm. happy and they're content with their life. They're, exactly. And that's a, probably one of the biggest things for everyone to know. They're calm. They're happy. They're playful. They're welcoming. It was joyous being with them. I mean, they, they were masters of their craft. And when we were haplessly eating these berries, they were tying the branches to the roof of the Jeep with, with the straps that they made from plant bark. We didn't have any tie downs. We didn't have any webbing in the Jeep. They made webbing out of plant bark, just like this guy on the hunt for the baboon had made rope out of plant bark in an instant, just like they'd made fire in an instant. It was, it was incredible what they did. And then later on, when I went with them to get honey from a baobab tree, it was the same thing. They needed to climb this big tree. I think I can probably find some video. I posted it on my Instagram. They needed to climb this big tree. And the tree is, you know, maybe 25 feet in diameter. And the branches are 15 feet high. So what do they do? They chop down the branch of a tree, of another tree and they fashion stakes out of it. And this elderly gentleman, and, and I actually did a post about this and I want to talk later in this podcast about how old they are, their longevity and dispel many, dispel many of the notions that they have a short lifespan. But this guy who, he was with us when we were hunting poison. I mean, how old do you think that guy was? 50, 60? 50, 60, yeah. yeah. Late 50s, early 60s probably. And it's, it's hard to know obviously because you know, who knows the, how they age, but for sure. He literally took these branches, made stakes out of them and hammered them into a tree. And within five minutes was 30 feet up in a baobab tree. It was incredible. Their, their ingenuity, their ability to move in these environments is astounding and impressive. And they don't, they don't have a scarcity mindset. They chill. When, there is, yeah. There is no need or want for things because their environment that they live in provides them everything that they need. Which is interesting to think about having seen how quote easy it was for them to live on a daily basis makes me think, Oh, of course, this is where humans evolved. This makes total sense. This East African rift Valley, this, you know, this, this rift where Australopithecines came out of the trees and became Paranthropus and Homo habilis, which I'll talk about in a moment, the divergence of those two species and the extinction of Paranthropus and, and then Homo habilis becomes Homo erectus. And then Homo erectus becomes Homo sapiens and probably branches off to Neanderthals and Denisovans. And this is a very good place for that to happen. It's warm mm-hmm. and there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of resources. There are plants that work for many different things. There are lots of berries at certain times of the year. There are roots that are edible, even though they spit the fiber out. There are many large game animals and there's water. I mean, that's exactly what humans need to have evolved. And it's probably most remarkable to me that eventually humans left that part of Africa and went to Northern Europe because in contrast, Northern Europe sounds like it was way, way less hospitable to humans than, than the East African Rift Valley. I mean, it, it's, it's a very fertile 
sort of abundant place in general. Yeah, I mean, population grows, you need to find more space. Yeah. You look for more resources and, and so the story goes. Yeah, so I wanna share a few photos, guys, from our hunt with the Hadza. This is Eric and here's the chief. Um, this is the guy that got the baboon. This is part of the baboon, probably the organs roasting on the fire. They literally made this fire in the middle of nowhere with a bow drill. We're all just hanging out. We're chilling um, and just really um, having a good time and enjoying the abundance of this hunt. Um, and more, another thing about the, the food, even if like, I don't think we saw them eat for you know, 24 plus hours before then. I don't know if they ate anything else, but it wasn't a ravenous feast once the thing was cooked. The, when people eat, there isn't a, a greed sort of focused way of consumption. People just sit there and wait to be fed. So then everybody takes a little bit, has a knife, they cut off small pieces and share it, and then you receive when you're offered. You don't ask for it, you don't go clamming for it, you don't go grab whatever. Like that to me was just another display of abundance. They didn't need to be clamoring over the meat and sort of having this, oh, I, I need to eat it now. They just wait to get offered the food. Yeah, and they're, they're pretty generous. I mean, one of the reasons that I did not feel guilty about eating at our lodge was you and I are 170 to 180 pounds and these guys are probably 110 or 120. Um, we would have taken a lot of their food <laughs> and I was happy to accept their food and experience it with them, but I also didn't want to eat all of their food. So these are Anthony being the rugged hiker. He is hanging out with these Hadza guys up here. You can see they always carry their bows. I think this was right before we got the honey or something, but we're just in the bush hanging out and we did hunt with dogs. So that's another thing for people to know that I got a lot of questions about how skinny the dogs were. And yeah, this is a survival subsistence environment for dogs too. And the dogs do get the scraps and they use the dogs to hunt the baboon. When the baboon was being chased in the tree and came down, the dogs attacked it. And um, this is the way of life for humans. And I don't know, I think people estimate that we've domesticated dogs and worked with them for 20 or 30,000 years, but they don't really keep the dogs as pets. Um, they keep the dogs as hunting animals and I think that um, the dogs are probably not fed enough. I don't think they're dying of starvation, but the dogs are not fed enough. They're, they could use a little more perhaps. They, or maybe, maybe the impression that we have of dogs in the US is we have a lot of overfed dogs on kibble and grains, but basically the dogs just ate the entrails of the animal and scraps and a few bones here and there. So the dogs have it kind of tough, but we saw the dogs having puppies, and um, we saw one dog get injured by the baboon and continue living, healing. And so the dogs appear to have enough nutrition to be able to keep living. And I think that you said this too, when I posted a picture, a video on my Instagram of us sitting by the fire, I got a lot of comments about the dogs and I appreciate everyone's sentiments about <laughs> these, these animals, but it's kind of just the way of life for the Hadza. I don't think they abuse the dogs. They're pretty stern with the dogs. They don't want the dogs coming near the fire and stealing their they're more valuable food, but I suspect, or I would hope that in the past when they had the ability to hunt bigger game, the dogs were perhaps a little bit better fed, but that's 100%. the explanation of the dogs. I mean, it's just, it's just a more magnified example of the frame of the Hadza. And again, yeah. they're small, like you said, 110, 120 pounds. And I got lots of questions like, why are they so small? Again, if they were in, Gor in Goro Goro Crater and they were able to hunt massive large game, there would have been plenty of leftovers for other animals as well. And when that stuff, when, when that food source shrinks up, uh, I mean, the, the dogs are obviously gonna get less of it than the humans. And th this is one of, again, if you care about the dogs more than the humans, that's just a, a conversation for another day. But if that's your priority, then you also want to reestablish their normal habitat you know, get, get the large game back in these ecosystems and all of the rest of the species are in a bountiful sort of setting. So I wanna make sure we cover a lot of these questions we asked them and the questions our audience asked. But another question that I got was, what's the big deal about the Hadza? And we kind of addressed that earlier, um, but I wanna just dig a little deeper on that one. So like we talked about, for me, it was a time machine, but Within, and this is something both Anthony and I have talked about in great detail, many people listening to this podcast on social media may not understand the burden of chronic disease in Western society, or perhaps you do, but it is enormous. 
rates of diabetes are skyrocketing, rates of obesity are skyrocketing, rates of chronic illness and autoimmunity, which are probably connected with metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance, which underlies all of that, are quite frankly rocketing. And the Hadza are fascinating because they are free from chronic disease. And that is another reason that originally, I believe the work of Boyd Eaton, Lauren Cordain, Rob Wolf, many of these in the paleo space, Mark Sisson was interesting to people because here is a time capsule. Here is a window which you and I were able to step through. Here is a doorway to the past. And what we find in the past, at least in the, the anthropology or the ethnography or the clinical epidemiology, or at least the clinical um, evaluation of these people, these hunter-gatherer groups, is that they're, they're free from chronic disease. Diabetes is non-existent in the Hadza. Obesity um, in the men is non-existent. There was only one woman that might even be considered to be obese, and she had spent a lot of time with the missionaries and was eating many more westernized foods than the rest of the women and the men. And from my you know, reading of Frank Marlowe's book about the Hadza, um, again, he did a PhD thesis about them and spent a lot of time with them uh, over the course of many years. Cancer was unheard of as far as he could tell. And so this is why it's interesting, is this hypothesis, this notion that here we see a window to the past and in the sense of chronic disease, the past looked way better. So what are they doing? And the question that really is burned into my brain, and you and I had many conversations about this on the trip, was what are the Hadza doing or what are they not doing yeah. that, that influences our chronic disease as Westerners? And I think that is something that you and I should talk about briefly. But before we get into that, I just want to show research that's been done on the Hadza. Again, all of these will be in the show notes. I'm sure I can forward them to Anthony as well, and he can put them in his show notes, but um, the Hadza have been assessed for this sort of thing. There have been many studies of their cardiovascular health, their physical activity. And as you can see that they have um, large amounts of time doing what is called moderate to vigorous physical activity. We saw that when we hunted with them <laughs> and they found no evidence of risk factors for cardiovascular disease in this population. They had a very low prevalence of hypertension and they had optimal levels of biomarkers for cardiovascular health, specifically they looked at, in this paper, they looked at systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and they looked at um, uh, CRP and other markers of inflammation, as well as uh, lipids, which were interesting to, to mention briefly. So you can see here, there is really no significant Im increase in systolic blood pressure as the Hadza age, but that is talked about as canon in medical school. Um, and there is this, this phenomenon of age-related hypertension, but it doesn't really happen. Again, this is a scatter plot, but you can see here men and women, purple and green. There's really no significant increase. I guess in this, you know, it goes from uh, an average systolic blood pressure uh, of maybe 110 to 120 at 80 years old. And the diastolic does the same thing. They're essentially flat throughout the lifespan. And you can compare that in this graphic to the NHANES data, which shows the percentage of people with hypertension by 60 plus, it's almost 70% in uh, the Nurses Health Association or the Nurses Health Study, the NHANES data, and you can look in the Hadza, it's very, very low. And then you can look at uh, their, they had a number of Hadza, they did total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides on. They looked at CRPs, and the CRPs were sometimes a little high, probably due to um, either recent exercise that was intense and or some sort of parasitic infection in the gut, though that appears to be fairly rare. They also looked at IgE levels, which might indicate some sort of parasitosis. But um, yep. Paul, you, Paul, have you ever done a, a CRP on yourself after a really hard workout? Oh yeah, it's, it's always high. I've had yeah. it in the threes, yeah. And I think we talked about this as well when <laughs> after we're done with the hunting, they were like, man, I think I'd do this again tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, it was intense. I mean, I, I thought... We kept up fine, but if we were to do that again every day, a couple days in a row, like that would have been, that would have been a lot. I got was cramping at the end of it. I, mean, I don't know, it was like 14, 15 miles, something like that. Yeah, intense. Very Over. little water, a lot of obviously a lot of muscle damage, like a lot of elevation, and yeah, who knows with the the CRP and some of that stuff. I would say that some of that stuff has to be an artifact of you know, they go on a hunt, they come back, they take their blood work, even if it's a day after. I mean. I try not to lift heavy two, three days before blood work because of the amount of variation that it can have in, in things like um, CRP. Yeah, I agree with you. I've 
done really hard workouts and had CRPs three, four, five HSCRPs that then came down to less than one uh, pretty consistently. But yeah, you know, when I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, the first couple of days were murder and then my body adjusted. And I think it probably would have been similar with the Hadza. If we'd hunted mm -hmm. every day with them for a few weeks, I thought we would have adjusted, but I don't hike 15 miles a day in Austin. I go to the gym and do front squats and hit the punching bag or, you know, I'm much more mellow than that. So it was, it was an adjustment for me too, but we both handled it fine. Um, and, and they, they made it look like it was nothing. I mean, they, like you said, they were sprinting and, and moving very fast. I missed smoking cigarettes and ganja throughout the whole hike, which we'll, we'll talk about, but I'll just show their lipids real quick in case you guys are curious. You can see this on the paper, which again, we'll link in the show notes. Interestingly, in the Hadza population, you can see the HDL is fairly low. This is what I would call is a genetic population with a low HDL. HDL is not a perfect metric, though I have suggested that HDL is a, is a proxy for metabolic health. I think that if you did uh, look at fasting insulin, you would find it to be quite low in these people, at least based on these triglycerides. You can see a lot of these triglycerides are very low. Some of them have higher triglycerides. I do wonder about these 120s, if these are postprandial triglycerides, if they were actually able to get true fasting triglycerides. Of course, as we know, fasting triglycerides will be higher. Excuse me, postprandial triglycerides will be higher. And you can see that actually one member of the Hadza tribe had an LDL of 172. That approaches levels that that um, that I certainly have. Mine are usually in the 200s now. I had one uh, that showed an LDL of 500, but usually my LDLs are in the 200s. I'll check when I get back to Austin. But a couple of them had 150s, 160s. But generally, uh, again, I think is that, that- Is that the LDL or total cholesterol? Oh, you're right. That's total. And here's LDL. You're right. I was wrong. Yeah, their LDLs were very low. I think some of these were so low they couldn't even calculate it. So I think that this is kind of like the HDL, like a genetic thing. I've yet to find a population of hunter-gatherers that see the same change in their lipid panel with animal-based diets that we see as Northern Europeans, um, which is a, a subject for another podcast. But I am very curious about this because there's been a lot of debate. I've done multiple podcasts in the past, guys, about uh, lipids and how I do not believe, and I think Anthony would agree with this, that LDL itself is a pure risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but it has to be interpreted in the context of overall metabolic health. But I really would like to find a population. I probably would have to look for more of a Northern European population, uh, something that's a little bit closer to my genetics. I'm sure they're out there. I mean, because I imagine that you and I are eating a diet that is fairly ancestral. It is pretty much animal-based and ancestral. I mean, we were eating meat and fruit and honey, which is essentially what the Hadza are eating minus five to 10% of their diet as Ugali. And, you know, interestingly, my LDL would probably be 200 on that diet. Uh, mm. I suspect yours would be as well. And, and theirs Somewhere. are 60 or 70. So there's a genetic thing going on here. And I don't believe for a moment that the meat and the fat and the organs are bad for me, but good for the Hadza. I think there's probably just some genetics around where their lipids get. But the, the point of all that discussion is just that the Hadza are very healthy. They are free from um, chronic disease. And that is, a, um, that is a very remarkable thing because there are very few populations in the US or westernized populations that you could say the same thing about. This is another um, uh, paper that I just wanna highlight, uh, hunter-gatherers as models in public health. And they say, um, they looked at the Hadza, they, they said longevity among small-scale populations approaches that of industrialized populations and metabolic and cardiovascular disease are rare. Obesity prevalence is very low. Mean body fat percentage is modest uh, in men and women and acute, uh, activity levels are high. It's basically just more evidence based on these epidemiologic evidence uh, in the, that these hunter-gatherer populations are very healthy. And I think that that is something, we don't even have populations to study like that in the Western world, other than maybe people who follow you, people who follow me. You know, those are today's modern hunter-gatherers. Like we can't even find populations that are free from chronic disease here. Mm -hmm. And here are these hunter-gatherers who are free. And so again, here's a window to the past. You show up in the DeLorean and you go, wow, these people are not fat. They're not sick. They're not depressed. They're not unhealthy. They don't get cancer. They don't get diabetes. What are they doing differently than us, right? Yeah, I think that you said it really interesting before. What are they, what are they doing, but what are they not doing? Exactly. I think that that is a huge part of it. And this um, author, his name is Wes Jackson. He's also head of the Land Institute who does a lot for regenerative agriculture. He's been around this stuff for a long time. Um, he has this concept called nature as measure. And this is how I think about a lot of stuff with health, where 
you know, the goal should be what is in a natural state of an organism. And that's what we see here. And that's what, what again, coming back to why the Hadza, why do we go see them? Mm -hmm. They're in the most natural state a human can be. It doesn't mean that humans can't thrive in eating much more, you know, fruit or tropical diets like the Katavans or things like that. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. But again, when you're looking at nature as measure, we need to sort of get to the foundational root of how should humans really be operating from where they were evolved in their environment. And very clear. I mean, the, the, there's so many things around what we talked about with microbiome, eating dirt, but just the, the level of stress difference that I had of like, we, we never knew what time it was. We never knew which day it was. We never felt like they were doing any work. We never felt like we had to do any work. Um, there was always ample time. There was only social connection. Like it was just a, 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 an abundance that like we talked about of resources, but also an abundance of social connection that I think like I'm sitting in this giant place in Miami alone and have to be for the next 10 days. It's like, I, I don't think I ever saw any of them alone. Maybe when they went to the bush to pee, that was it. Like th there's so many factors here that I've always thought of like, okay, having purpose, like ha having a direct contribution to the people around you in your community is I think really, really important, understated. And these people all have that, you know, you go out and hunt, you go out and, in and gather, you bring it back, you share with people directly Right now, you know, you know, even you and I do a lot of work that's digital. It, it, it's such an abstraction from providing the people that are near and close to us. And I think that that sort of like purpose and mission and like why we exist and meaning of humans gets lost as well. Like, I mean, there's just so many simple things that are highlighted in like many, many great books that I've read about, but just see it in practice and see that the ease of life. I mean, it's it's so tempting to take out a simple nutritional thing say, Oh, eating these like very clean diet. Like, yes, that's certainly part of it, but there's so many other variables to this thing. And that's, I think one of the biggest impressions that I had is that you cannot extract these things in isolation and say like, this is the cause. And like, this is what we need to fix in isolation. Like this is important. Everything else is important as well. Uh, there's so many things that, I mean, I think we've, we've departed from nature so starkly. I mean, being in, in Miami and like walking around, just like the, the contrast of being here is insane. And I saw that spectrum all the way from the, when we were saying with the Hadza, this like pinnacle of, of nature as measure to the Datoga tribe, which mm -hmm. I think like we're starting to lose a little bit and people will like, they're healthy. They like healthy. They're eating way more Ugali, but seem to be like not as happy and a little bit more listless. And then you go to somewhere like Karatu, which is this town in between there and Arusha, which is, you know, like way more industrialized food. Um, people were less in a community. They were more individualized. And you go to Arusha, which is even bigger um, uh, population, larger city than it was in Zanzibar. And like the more traditional civilization ramps up, the more you lose these things like community the more you increase stress, the more you increase industrially processed food, the more you increase squalor and a terrible quality of life. And the further you retreat, it's like the more you extract nature and like put it, put it away and separate humanity from nature, the more problems we have. At least that, that's what I got out of the trip. I, I observed the same thing. Many people from 10,000 feet would look at civilization, quote unquote, in Karatu, good old Karatu, Arusha and the town kind of near Lake Yasi and say, these people have more than the Hadza. They have four walls. The Hadza have these thatched circular kind of, you know, uh, oblong huts that are temporary. They live often in rock shelters or under the auspices of rock. Um, they're making their fire. They don't know where their next meal is coming from, but they go hunt it. So people in, in these cities, you know, in towns, many would say they have more, but this fence was completely opposite that. They were much poorer in Karatu, much poorer in the cities. And at the risk of sounding incredibly cliched or passe, the Hadza seemed rich. They were rich in terms mm -hmm. of their mood. They were rich in terms of their time. They were rich in terms of their overall demeanor and their abundance of food. They were closer to nature. And 
that is the challenge I think that all of us face now is that's very clear to me as well. We're way too far from nature and nature will tell us what to eat because it's the foods that we can hunt and the foods that we can gather. And as we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, there's a big emphasis on hunting. We're like hunter gatherers. And then nature can tell us when to sleep and when not to sleep. And there's so much out there that's just built around who we are as humans. And I completely agree with you. And it's become, I don't know why we've gotten away from this super simple concept, but I think that's why paleo ideas and ancestral ideas are so popular now. And that's why I've started to think about this in terms of the remembering something bigger than a carnivore diet, something bigger than an animal-based diet. It's all of these other pieces that make us human. And you know, you and I went, or at least I went to Tanzania to see the Hadza, mainly to see their diet and see how healthy they were. But what we found was, not surprisingly, and it, a completely comprehensive way to live your life mm. that's all in nature and is so beautiful in so many ways. Not perfect. Like I said, the DeLorean doesn't work perfectly. These people have been corrupted, quote unquote, in some ways, but they were doing so many things that you and I strive to do on a daily basis. They were mobile. Remember when we saw them by the fire and they had the best squats we've ever seen? They're, they're moving. They're doing low level activity. They're playing. They're spending time with community. They're in the freaking sun. They're, you know, they're eating animal foods as a primary source. They're eating nose to tail. All these things are the things that you and I talk about trying to do in our lives in Austin, Texas, or wherever we are. And most of the world around us is just retreating further and further from nature when you and I are, and many people that we know and people listening to this are trying to get further into it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah, the, the complexity we have now to manage our lives to return to what used to be free and abundant is, is incredible. One of my friends just found out that they're pregnant and they're like asking me a bunch of like, hey, what should we do around changing things? And, and like I was trying to think of through all the things of like even acquiring clean water is like, okay, you have to get this specific filter and then get this, this, everything else. And then like, okay, when you're cooking food, make sure it's these things and not those, like this type of pan. And then when you're storing food, make sure it's in glass and not plastic. And like the list just goes on and on and on. And like our environment has become so complex to get to a point that is just, you, like there's so much bandwidth that needs to be taken up in your head and so much stress just in trying to revert to a normal lifestyle. And like, I think to take that spectrum that I was talking about earlier, all the way to the end being in Miami, it's like, yes, okay, this is like wealthy American city and we have more here, more diabetes, more chronic disease, more stress, more divorce, more loneliness, more depression, more anxiety, more suicide. I mean, th these things just don't exist in this culture. I mean, we ask them about more physical pain. Like we, the concept of suicide to them doesn't make sense. I asked Gorgio, I don't think you were around when I asked them this, but if they have any physical pain, like back aches or anything like that, knee problems, shoulder problems. And it was another thing, like they, you ask them some of these questions and they're just like confused, like, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't fall out of a tree, why would it hurt? It's kind of like what their answer was. They don't know what depression is. They don't get, I mean, they, yeah. they, we asked them about depression and they said, you're allowed to be sad for two or three days and then after that, you can't be sad anymore. And Nobody we really saw there looked sad. I don't think depression exists when you're living that way. And again, we're not trying to romanticize them. We're just trying to take what we can from this. And I love what you said there. You said that so well. We have to go to, ex to extreme measures, to the ends of the earth, essentially, to create a life that in any way, shape, or form mirrors theirs, mirrors a life that exists without any effort of theirs in nature. That's where we've come from as humans. And we've gotten so far away from it the main question is how we get back there. So it's incredible. Um, I know you got a lot of questions from your audience about uh, child rearing and, and men and women relations. Let's talk about a few of those because I know people will be curious. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the... Good? Yeah, we're good. I, you're back now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One of the most interesting things that I saw was just a very, very clear gender roles, and, which is a very taboo thing in our society right now, that there must be absolute equality between men and women. They should do the same exact things, be paid the same exact way. And like, there is an example that we were with the Hadza that it works to have gender different things. And so like, I think that 
It doesn't mean that it must be that way, but it's at least an example that humans can thrive in a condition where there are clear gender roles. And so the men went out and hunted, the women foraged, took care of camp, raised the children. Like those are also very important things. It's not to diminish what the women do. The women and the men both have complete respect for each other because they know that they would not be able to survive without each other. But they say, hey, I got this, you got that, great. It's a societal pact that works really, really well. Uh, but to see them throughout the day, they are very much in their own little cliques, primarily based upon gender. And then this thought of as a very taboo and wrong thing in modern society, and it was not, it was not at all. And uh, yeah, the, com again, complete respect for another gender. I don't know if you, you had any observations about that as well. It, that's how it was. Everybody asked me about my photos, where are the women? And I haven't posted the photos. I don't even know if I took a lot of photos of the women. Maybe you got more photos of the women and we can post those. But the women are in a separate, quote, fire. Like the women are in a separate part of camp. And it's not that they don't hang out with the men. It's that the men are hanging out at the men's fire and the women sometimes have a fire or just hanging out in a different yeah. part of camp. I mean, they're literally 100 feet apart, but they're they're doing their things. It's like there's a men's club and there's a women's club. And they they, from what I understand, we didn't see them at night. They do sleep in the same hut together, married couples. The Hadza are primarily monogamous. Other tribes are not. The Datoga were not. They had a, a number of brothers that shared a bunch of wives. And um, you brought up the Datoga earlier. We talked about the Datoga in terms of encroachment on the Hadza land, but the Hadza do uh, choose a wife or they mutually choose each other. Often women say they choose a husband based on yeah. how good a hunter they are. And Men say they choose a wife based on uh, how well, quote unquote, I believe the chief said she can produce the nectar of life, which is presumably breast milk, but who knows? Um, and, you know, they, and how well they can care and rear the children. And so the, the children were with the mothers, the children were walking around camp, the children looked happy and healthy, and the children were given a lot of freedom. They were given a lot of realm and range to explore and to make mistakes. I mean, you and I were sitting on rocks with, two of the middle-aged or even you know, young elderly uh, men making arrows. And there was probably a two-year-old child there right by the fire. And the child's father was there, who's a younger Hadza um, tribesman. And he didn't say anything to her. It was just like, you know, you're gonna get burned or you're gonna be aware. And she clearly already had a knowledge of the fire and didn't go and get burned. But there was a fire on the rock they were using to straighten the arrows. And this is, there's no barrier there, this two-year-old child is allowed to get right up against the fire. And I think that they, they learn these things and the, the children are treated as little adults, which has pros and cons. Um, yeah. And I yeah. saw the children getting a lot of autonomy. And on my flight to Costa Rica, there were some screaming children on the airplane. And as much as I was trying to cultivate my inner Zen, I was about to lose it. And it reminded me that we didn't really hear many of the children crying or screaming or acting out at these Hadza camps. They were just cruising around, probably because they're mostly barefoot, uh, cruising around, hanging out in the dirt and doing things that human kids are supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, I mean, after that child by the fire making arrows left, we watched it walk. I mean, the nearest person was probably like 50 yards away, but it was like down this like really rocky, not fit for a, a two-year-old path and just like started walking that way. We were like, uh. We had some apprehension. We're like, okay, let it, let, it, let it go. Let's see what happens. Not fit and by our standards, but that two-year-old did just fine, right? Exactly. And, and that's, I think, what they have this treatment of children like they're adults. Like they can figure out what's going on. They learn from the world around them. And I think that this is just, like, again, like we're, we remove ourselves from nature. We have to make up all these rules and teach kids how to live life instead of nature just showing kids how to live life itself. And yeah, the, like you said, there was no acting out. There were no fits. There was no crying. The one time I saw a child crying was a chief's kid. I don't know, maybe one yeah. and a half, two years old, tripped over a branch. Yeah. And started crying because it was in pain. And the chief consoled it and it was a great example. And it was sort of like looked at the branch, it was like bad branch. And like, just like we would do. Yeah. Kid was fine in, in five seconds. Uh, yeah, there's otherwise, I mean, even the same thing with, with the dogs, even though they weren't pets, most well-behaved animals that I've ever seen. Uh, same with the children. It's like, these are prototypical, like, I wish my kids would be like this sort of 
children. It was pretty cool to see. And so I'm trying to think what other questions we can answer about men and women and their relations. I mean, there is clear respect between men and women. The women are not abused. They're held in high regard. Um, they, they, they certainly um, care about how much meat they're going to get from their husbands. But because of the odds of structure, the women don't eat as much meat as men. And so going back to the first paper I showed, or one of the first papers I showed with Hodds of Preferences for Food um, by Frank Marlowe, in that paper, the, the women rated honey the most, and then berries, baobab, and meat. And I think that's kind of false. I think if you ask the women, they would, they would want to eat meat first, but they just don't get as much of it because for whatever reason, the men get more yeah. of the meat. So we well, could you, see that asked, as a little bit. You asked and they said that uh, they prefer meat as well. Yeah, yeah, we did. And like we said, we asked them, what do you dream about? <laughs> they, dream about they dream about meat. And we asked them, what happens after you die? Some of these cosmology questions are probably interesting to address as well. So we asked them, what is the meaning of life? And they said, to, to be the best that you can in whatever you're doing, which I thought was interesting. And then do you remember what they said when we asked them, what happens after you die? Yeah, they said, you, we, you move camp because you, your body starts smelling within a couple of days. They had like no concept of we, life we after asked death. Them what happens, like what was before you were born or why were you born? And the one woman said, I, you know, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here and I'm just going to live my life basically. And there's basically no existential questions to be, that are being asked. And it just goes to show, like, is, is that just, uh, you know, I've had some, I put some of these ideas on social media. I've got quite a bit of pushback. I think people get really tied up from an identity perspective with whatever faith or religion that they have. And so people go, no, no, there's like plenty of societies that, that have this. And my, my question is, is like, it's not, an, it doesn't seem like an innate human thing to have these existential questions that we always have. It seems to be a little bit more like we ask more of these questions, the more civilized we get. Hmm. Yeah, this is just a pattern I'm seeing. Like, maybe that's wrong. Maybe I don't have enough data. I don't know. I'm happy to be wrong about this, but it's just it was interesting. I've, I've never come across a culture or a group of people who uh, haven't at least grappled with those questions to some degree, and then made myths and stories and whatever to sort of cope with this human condition of having to think about these questions and how confusing they are. This didn't seem to care about them at all, which is like a freedom that I am very envious of personally. They were just living in the moment, right? They were spending time with their children, spending time with their families, hunting, spending time with their friends. And they had one origin story about Nacha Allah or Nacha Allah, this original man and how he found the poison that they used for their arrows. And he saw birds eating the flower and the birds died. Um, but that was the only origin story that we could get out of them. And if you look at Frank Marlowe's book where I was looking for more information, there's really not a whole lot about cosmology. There are some stories that, that he said that they had told him, but the, the group that we were with had no, had no concerns about existential questions. And so what a fascinating possibility, or at least thing to consider that as we remove ourselves from nature, we worry much more about existential questions and cosmology. Yeah. When in fact, most of us can remember the last time we went camping. I get a little existential when I'm camping, but at least for me, I'm just mostly enjoying being in nature and how calm it is and wanting to be with the people that I'm with there and cook this food over this fire or walk this trail or swim in this lake. And it, it feels like I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's very possible that, and again, not to overly romanticize or become um, uh, you know, too, too passe, but when we're living in nature, maybe we, don't, maybe we don't wrestle with these things as much. We're just more at peace. Yeah, I mean, I felt more at peace, that's for sure. I did too, man. <laughs> I thought the best question was one that we've touched on briefly, but I want you to um, share your thoughts on this because it was one that you brought up in the car on the way there, which was we really wanted to ask them, why do you continue to live as hunter-gatherers? Because there are pastoralist tribes. And by that, I mean, there are tribes of Datoga, Maasai, other tribes around in the area who are herding goats and cows and that are growing corn and growing um, what else did they grow? They grew onions, but there was one other crop they grew. Basically onions and corn is like yeah. the vast bulk of it. And it's such a, such an, a weird display. Like the, the corn is very local, but the onions are people from Middle Kenya. East in Kenya and other places that in China that are coming because they know how valuable the land is, plant all these onions, have these crazy large houses, put all the onions in there, basically price fix and manipulate the prices of the onions. And then the price goes up 
because they hold the storage of all the onions. They all sort of cooperate to do this, and then they sell the onions into the markets. And it's, it's this really weird representation of of um, using agriculture not only for just doing a monocrop, but to create this accumulation of wealth by just a few people. Um, so yeah, they, they obviously have exposure to missionaries, to tourists. Um, they they also just don't seem to care at all about the way we live. Like there were very little questions for us. They're like, oh, you live in these big cities. What's that like? How's your life? Like nobody cared. No. no they, yeah, they, they were just content with their life. But yeah, we, so we asked this question. Um, and yeah, the, the answer was basically, I don't want to be told what to do. <laughs> it was a big part of it. I don't want to depend on um, basically an artificial constraint of if there's water or not. And um, like they have everything that they need. It's like the, sort of like what I got out of it. I don't know if you glean anything else other answers. I mean, it's, it's tough because the translation was to somebody who doesn't speak English and they speak Swahili and then the Hadza don't speak Swahili <laughs> natively. So it's like you lose a little bit going each way, but curious as far as like what you got out of the answer. Well, we have it on video. So when we make the video of the trip, which we'll hopefully do in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll let people see the actual process of asking them these questions. But I remember the chief saying, we want to eat meat. We like to eat meat um, and we like to hunt. And they didn't want to be pastoralists. They just didn't think, and again, this may be my game of telephone and me interpreting it, but my sense was they did not think that hunt, that, that excuse me, that, that pastoralists and growing things and herding would be fun which it didn't look like fun at all. No. We passed people on the side of the road who were tending goats and cows and they did not look like they were having a fun time. They were just sitting there. They weren't exploring. Yeah. It was boring as shit. And they just looked really, they just looked really bored, bored to tears sometimes. And the Hadza were like cruising around. They see a bird, they run over. There's a rush of excitement. They see a little, they see a little straw in a tree that these stingless bees make and they go, oh, canoa. And they go, they find some honey, they get all excited. They make a, they make a fire. Like the actual pace of life and the amount of enjoyment that appeared to be happening with their lifestyle versus these pastoralists in the Datoga was marked. When we went to the Datoga village, there were these mud thatched huts, which were pretty depressing, uh, I thought. Even though mm -hmm. this woman was showing us this, this bed that she'd made from sticks and an animal hide, um, it was dark in there. It was smoky. Uh, they just, they, they didn't have a lot of joie de vie, or at least that was my interpretation like the Hadza did. I mean, the chief, the Hadza chief, I'll have to post some videos of him. He's a character. He's like a comedian. He's acting. He's making sounds and noises and miming animals. And all these guys are smiling and they're happy to see us and they're calling us friend. And the Datoga were friendly, but they were just kind of not as excited to be living life, at least from what I observed. And and, and I think the Maasai were the same way when we would see them on the side of the road and talk to them. And, and those were really the three tribes that we talked to. And so I think the Hadza get this and, and they're like, why would we want to do that? They realize we have it best. They, they're sort of, they're pretty smart for, for where they are. Yeah. My sense was they were like, man, hunting is fun and eating this meat is better than eating that meat. And as we found out, just because you're raising goats and cows doesn't mean you eat that meat all the time because you can't eat that meat all the time because you would soon have no herd. So we couldn't get a straight answer all the time into how much meat the Datoga and the Maasai were eating, uh, but there certainly appeared to be eating more ugali and more sort of grain-based foods, which are, we know are not as nutritious uh, for them. So the Hadza really, in my opinion, seem to say, we think it's more fun to be hunter-gatherers. We wanna yeah. hunt and we wanna eat good food, which is, kind of like you and me and why we do this stuff in the front first place, you know, like, why do you go hunting at Rome ranch? Why do we seek out good food from regeneratively raised farms? Because it's fun because the food is better and we want to be able to do cool shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, even when, while we were hunting, there was a band of, I don't know, eight or 10 of us. And it would be constant laughter whenever like we were at the actual trying to kill the animal part. And this is big social group jovial group we'd pass farmers along the way oh. the toga tribe and it would be like one person with a stick smacking cattle and just this desolate sort of picture and it, it was like to contrast that of course they don't want that they want to hang out with their friends and have a good life 
Yeah, and I mean, conducted. we'll make we'll make a video and you guys can see all of this, but we were just like a band of, I don't know, marauders for lack of a better word. We were just cruising around and it was just fun. It was like, it was one of the most fun days I've had in my life. I mean, it reminded me of being on the Pacific Crest Trail, except I was out with a bunch of guys who knew what the heck they were doing in the bush. They could find honey, they could shoot birds, we could kill animals for sustenance. And it was like this big, it was like, oh, this is exactly what humans are supposed to be doing. This is the way we lived. This is very satisfying. Um, I've often said that my time on the Pacific Crest Trail was some of the most joyous of my life because it was so simple. I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada in the year 2000. I didn't have a cell phone primarily because there were no cell phones in 2000. But all I had to do every day was get up, walk, eat, and stay dry. And the Hadza have it even better. They get to walk, get up, hunt, eat good food that they've actually hunted, the freshest food on the planet. You know, I did a controversial thoughts video last week about, um, which is like a mini podcast I do about the thing I missed most in Africa. And I was contrasting the quality of the food we ate with the Hadza and the quality of the food we ate when we were in Karatu and other cities. And there was really no comparison. Um, I, I was, you know, when I was in Arusha, it was a struggle to have to communicate to the waiter, I want meat, but I don't want you to cook it in seed oil. I don't want any spices. I don't want any wheat in the sauce. I don't want anything but meat on the grill. Like just cook it for me on a fire like the Hadza. And preferably that, that cow was wild. I know it wasn't, but all the animals we hunted with the Hadza were. And so that juxtaposition was quite striking for me. And it was really clear why they would want to keep doing this. I'm just impressed. And here's another reason that we went to visit them because they've had the prescience to realize that they're at the, they're at the, the border of a transition and they're choosing not to step over. Yeah. I mean, I think it's incredibly impressive. Yeah. And it's inspiring to me to, to uphold a more of that lifestyle in my own life and not go for what maybe seems easy, but as this trade-off, it's not worth it. I mean, in so many things in life, exactly. anything that's easy, like there's this chasm where it seems like, okay, well, like, this is an innate human thing to trade energy expenditure for the easy thing. That is always a poor trade-off. Don't be lazy. Um, I want to, we've already almost gone two hours. We're going to have to do a second podcast. Um, I'm going to get kicked out of my hotel room in a moment, but let's, let's just address a few other questions that I know people are going to be burning with here. Salt. So basically the Hadza mm -hmm. had no salt, but when we brought salt to them, they ate it with uh, enjoyment. Was that your sense too? Yes. I, and then the question is like, where otherwise did they get salt? Do they need salt? Um, a couple of observations we made, obviously they drink way way less water than we do. And so their, their fluid intake is far less. Um, they're also eating wild meat, which presumably has more minerals in it, which is why it tastes quote unquote gamey as well as the water they drink is unfiltered. So it, yeah, I mean, they certainly enjoy it and want it and like it when they have it, but they, they otherwise don't have access to it and don't die. And they didn't seek it either. There wasn't, and maybe if we'd spent more time with them or maybe when we go back, we could ask them, do you guys ever seek salt? But they didn't go to like a marshy bog and collect salt. They didn't chew on any plants for salt, but they certainly liked it when we gave it to them. So we're sort of stuck with our hands up, like, well, do we know? I think that um, my sense of this, and this is just my personal opinion, is that, that human kidneys and human physiology is quite adaptable. And there's a, there's, a, there's a bottom end to the amount of sodium that we need in our diet. And there's probably a top end to how much we want and our body will tell us that. But in the middle there, maybe more flexible than we believe and you can adjust. The first few days I was in uh, Africa, I ended up eating less salt just because I was like, well, it's not around. Let me see how I feel. And every time I've tried that, I feel a little bit woozy. Every time I would stand up, I would get a little woozy. I could tell. And then I added a little bit back and it certainly tasted good. But maybe if I had a month or two with no salt, my kidneys would adjust and I would absorb, uh, resorb more. Um, but yeah, the salt thing is questionable and I think people can explore that on their own. The other thing that I think is really important that I want to make sure that I address and we talk about with extreme clarity at the end of this podcast is their life expectancy. Hmm. So there is such an insidious notion out there that hunter gatherers lead short lives. And this is just wrong. Um, our observations, I'll let you weigh in with yours, but my observations were at least that there were many members of the tribe who were elderly and quite spry, very vital. So I spoke about this on a previous podcast with James Clement. You guys can go back and see that. It's at hardensoil.co. You can just search on the learn tab. It's called squaring of the morbidity curve. We see this in hunter-gatherer populations that 
vitality, vigor, chutzpah, for lack of a better word, persist way later in life. I mean, we were out there hunting, sprinting, climbing trees with a guy who was 50 or 60 years old, who's in a full freaking squat, who has a six pack. Nobody I know who's that age moves like that or lives like that. And so their health span dwarfs ours. There are many elderly people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, we were with a small group of tribe, maybe 40 people. So there were maybe a few who were in their 70s and 80s. The majority of them were probably across the age range. But the notion that humans in hunter-gatherer tribes live short lives is based upon higher rates of infant and childhood mortality that confounds the numbers. So be very careful when you hear that, that number repeated or that parroting of that information, which is wrong. The, the, the generally, all of the research I've seen across anthropologists time and time again suggest that if hunter-gatherers make it to young adulthood, to the teenage years, they live as long as we do and perhaps even longer, and they certainly live better with a longer health span. And that infant mortality probably has to do, as far as I can tell, with the fact that it's dangerous being a kid in the wilderness. We saw kids right by fires. We saw kids walking around in camp by themselves. Uh, there's a lot of snake bites in some cultures. There's, it's very easy for a kid to fall and hurt themselves. Um, and, and being born in the bush, there's no field hospitals here. These women basically go to a tree and squat and have a baby. And so infant mortality is higher as it is among other species. I mean, chimpanzee, bonobo, infant mortality, I believe is higher. So I think we just have to accept, though it's a little bit of an uncomfortable notion for me, that wild quote unquote humans may have higher levels of mortality. And that doesn't mean that they lead short lives. It means that there are downsides, quote unquote, or there are risks that come from living in the wilderness. What are your thoughts about that? And what did you observe? Yeah, I mean, this is the truth that nobody likes to talk about is that it is normal for most mammals to, to not have 100% of their infants survive into adulthood. And we've created an environment where our expectation is that is now normal. And so when we're confronted with anything that butts up against that, then we have this weird disconnect of, of we, we can't mentally grapple with it. And so, I mean, th there's a lot of, I think, pushes of the notion of, okay, well, these people are just uncivilized. They don't know how bad they have it. We're going to, we're going to save them and bring them into civilization so we can save all their young and help them, you know, not have to expend so much energy hiking in the woods to get a baboon, all this type of stuff. And I, I, get, I don't know if they would trade a hundred percent infant success to adulthood to live, you know, a, a more Western lifestyle. I don't know. I don't know if they would. Um, it would be an interesting question for, for next time, for sure. Uh, but, but yeah, the, there was a very equal representation of pretty much all age groups throughout the entire population. It just seemed like there were a couple of like every five years kind of spread out from infant all the way to probably 80, 80 years old or so. Um, then people ask, you know, question I got out is, okay, if, if not so much, like how do people die? And from what we got from Eric and some other people as well, it was a lot of uh, trauma of falling out of trees. So you're talking about yes. earlier, the guy who climbed up a tree 30 feet in, in a matter of minutes, like, well, he can also fall out of that tree really easily. And that's, that's how they that, die. Yeah. They, they can die from that. Um, if things get infected, if the, you know, if the, the, the dog had a giant gash on its back from one of the baboons, um, this type of stuff can happen to humans as well. And that can get infected and not having, you know, antibiotics for something like that obviously is a risk for mortality for sure. Uh, but yeah, there was, there, it's not like there was this after, after 26 years, I think it was like the average hunter gatherer lifespan is quoted in a lot of papers like 26, 28 years, or even 22, like after we hit um, agriculture, it's like, it's not like there were, there were no more people. It was an equal representation of ages. Yeah. I mean, you see it played out. It's, it's obviously wrong, right? Like yeah. whether you think that life expectancy is 33 or 43, there was a huge amount of people who were older than 43. And there were a lot yeah. of people where they were 50 or 60 who looked very young. And I posted about this and uh, there's a lot of my social media about it. So people have questions about this. I encourage you to look this term up, the compression of morbidity, the, the squaring of the morbidity curve. Here's an article about it that I'll link to. In, um, in the show notes, the compression of morbidity. Again, I spoke about it with 
James Clement in a previous podcast, but the notion that hunter-gatherers live lives that are nasty, brutish, and short is false. And Jared Diamond says that in this paper that I was sharing with you, it's false. They live lives that, that that's why we wanted to go. So this is the question that keeps we keep answering is why the heck did you guys do this? Because we wanted to see this firsthand and we saw so many of these things playing out differently than the mainstream wants to parrot notions about them. So there's a real, real difference there that most people have come to believe. And that, that segues very quickly into discussions about blue zones. If you guys have questions about blue zones, I've done multiple podcasts on the fallacy of blue zones with Tommy Wood and many others. Uh, I spoke about it in the podcast I did with Mary Ruddick about Icar Icaria in Greece. People say in my comments like, well, okay, you're seeing these hods, uh, they're super healthy, they're eating a lot of meat. How do you explain the blue zones where people eat a lot of vegetables? And the thing I say back is, first of all, that's false. In most of these blue zones, people eat a ton of meat. The notion they're eating mostly plant foods is completely false. Just like the notion that the Hadzas are a plant-based culture, which National Geographic has printed. It's completely false. They're so meat-centric. Korea is meat-centric. So many of these cultures that are considered to be blue zones are actually meat-centric. And the blue zones are cherry-picked, right? There are only a few cultures in the world where people are supposed to be overly represented at larger ages. But there are many cultures in the world that are very meat-centric that have higher rates of centenarians in the general population that were left out of the blue zones. So that's all I'll say about the blue zones and the fact that I've talked about it at length and they're a fallacy. Um, and I'll mention that if you look at um, the Loma Linda cohort of Seventh-day Adventists, there have been many studies I've talked about multiple times showing that their sperm quality, their, uh, the sperm motility and the numbers are very highly reduced. So if that constitutes a blue zone, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and just so everyone knows, I'm gonna have a podcast. I'm getting Stephen Gundry to come on my podcast. Uh, soon, he's the author of The Plant Paradox and one of these guys that always talks about the blue zones and parrots wrong information. And I will disabuse him of those notions for all of you to see in the very near future. So I wanted to address that because I got a lot of questions about blue zones. And every time I think about that, it makes me a little bit frustrated. Well, well, so yeah, we, we saw it firsthand. And we talked about it earlier in the podcast that people parrot things that aren't true. Yes, with and, fiber and, as well. Yeah. And so Hadza do not eat 150 grams of fiber a day. No not way. Eat, they don't eat a plant based diet with 40 plus varieties. I, you know, I want to be careful to make sure that that does not mean that humans can't eat that and live a long time. Sure. Life. Yeah. And it's so like, that's totally fine. And if that exists, th that's okay. But just don't accept what people say about population studies without actually going and observing some of the stuff yourself is what I would say. Like I, I sort of trusted this stuff with the Hadza the first time I learned about them. I don't know, five plus years ago. I'm like, oh, interesting. They probably eat a lot of fiber and because of whatever reason I'm, I go there, like they don't eat any fiber. And like, I, I want to go to some of these blue zones and some of these other areas where people had more traditional diets and do some more studying and be like, where is this threshold where people are eating? Is it processed food? How much of it is processed? Is it, is it their stress goes up? Is the community is lost? Like where are the triggers that lead to more chronic disease? And I don't necessarily think it has to be, you know, they go from hunter gatherer and then you're screwed. Like, I don't think that the line is that sharp, uh, but the information about these populations, like I trust nothing about <laughs> anything that I'm reading anymore that I've now I've seen the Hadza and what's printed about the Hadza. That means we've got our work cut out for us, my friend, but that sounds good. We'll have many more adventures. Yeah. We'll, we'll start a TV show. Yeah. It'll be great. Um, but I do, I think from my perspective, I just want to add that, and I think you and I might think about this a little differently, and I love your broad perspective. I was constantly trying to look at which things the Hadza were not doing from a food perspective. And I think we can clearly say they're, they're really not eating nearly the amount of seed oils that are present in, um, in modernized society, if any. They definitely had ugali, but it wasn't the majority of their diet. And I think the ugali, which is the cornmeal, increase gradually. And I remember sitting with you, this is one of my other favorite quotes from the trip. We're sitting in one of these Datoga the mud huts or mud structures. And we're looking at them and we're going, yeah, they're not quite as ripped as the Hadza, but they don't have diabetes either. It's not the Ugali. Um, and it's also not the honey. Um, so for all the people out there who are texting me or putting messages like, aren't you worried about getting out of ketosis when you have honey? Um, I am not worried about ketosis at all. I think it's a valuable thing for humans occasionally. It's an awesome way to treat obesity 
and metabolic dysfunction. But the Hadza don't worry about being in ketosis. They just are from time to time because they're fasting or they don't have food. But when they get honey, they eat it. And it was very clear to me on this trip that even something as, as vilified as ugali and cornmeal is probably not the cause of chronic disease in humans. Mm. Um, yeah, and ugali is an ugali. Like the, there was a massive difference between growing the corn locally and harvesting it yourself and stone grinding it to mixing some industrially processed cornmeal with vegetable oil, exactly, and packaging it and then eating that. Which both of those would be considered ugali, not the same thing. So this is another thing of like food samples and, and things like that. When we do studies, we say, like, okay, they ate, ate ugali. Well, there's a little bit more nuance to that. Yeah, and those nuances is what we were trying to ferret out, trying to really tease out. But I will say that when we were in Karatu, when we were in Arusha, there was much more obesity. Oh, and, yeah. and the two clear dietary trends, in addition to other trends, which you appropriately note, was more processed sugar. There was way more soda and processed junk food. There were way more like flours and processed breads, and there was much more seed oils. And so I think that we, that's what we believe to be a major problem. And if you look at the way the Hadza are mostly eating, let's be very clear about this. It's mostly meat and organs with some berries occasionally, some baobab occasionally, some tubers occasionally, and honey when they can get it. And I think that it's very clear that that type of a diet leads them to a life that is essentially free of chronic disease. And that's valuable. And that's what I tried to create around an animal-based diet, more broadly speaking than a carnivore diet to give people more inclusion, more options. But, you know, and I'm not advocating for maize or cornmeal, but then again, I'm also not saying that that's the worst thing in the world. I don't think it's a great thing for humans. Where's the nutrients? What's the point of doing that other than pure calories? But I don't believe that carbohydrates, gas, even grain-based carbohydrates like corn are really instantly creating diabetes in people. Though, we need to go back and do fasting insulin on the Datoga and fasting insulin on the Hadza and do a little bit more uh, investigation. But at least visibly, the, the, the Datoga were not massively obese. They were definitely softer than the Hadza, but they were not massively obese or frankly diabetic. So yeah. there's a lot of interesting things there. And, and um, another thing that we, we observed, um, just to get this in quick before we have to wrap up, is that the, the more, it's like the more dependence we have to have on externalizing our food sources, the yeah. more screwed up we get. And we saw this when we had to go to a grocery store in Arusha. We didn't have to go to, when people have to go to grocery stores, there was a massive amount of vegetable oil there, seed oils, safflower, sunflower, et cetera. The tallow was right next to it. They called it beef oil there. It was cheaper. It was cheaper than the seed oil, which is insane. And we were talking with Gasper, our guide on the way to the airport, uh, dropped me off. And he was saying that there, all the doctors tell them, do not eat red meat, do not eat animal fat. You have to eat the seed oils or else you're gonna get sick, you're gonna get diabetes. They say it leads to diabetes. He said, well, my grandma, she lived past a hundred plus years old. And like the thing she always, she walked to the market and she obtained the beef oil herself. And she said that this is what keeps me young and healthy or whatever he said. And he's, he could never understand that because all the doctors told him one thing and, and the other. And we asked him like, do you think that, like the Hadza are sick because and you have diabetes because they eat red meat? <laughs> and it was like this, this we, people want to listen to doctors and the, the fact that this propaganda has spread to developing Tanzania, it, I mean, that's, that was the most frightening part of the trip for me is just like to hear his recounting of, he's really trying to do the right thing. He has a school of children. He has kids himself. He wants to do the right thing. He's told one thing. He has this, this seed oil there. It's more expensive than tallow, more expensive. And is eating it because he knows no difference. Because he's been told by a doctor that red meat causes diabetes. Yeah. The, unreal. Like, I thought it was cool that we could go and help him connect the dots because we're saying to him, hey, Gasper, you've been going to see the Hadza for 16 years. You don't, you don't see this? What was cool was I got to stay with Gasper an extra day in Arusha after you went to Zanzibar. And I actually went to a church service with him, which is a whole different story. <laughs> uh, it was this Pentecostal church and it was intense. Um, they were singing for literally 45 minutes straight when I got in the door and it was, it was wild. Um, but uh, I had dinner, I had breakfast, I had lunch with he and his wife and his wife told the same story that she had an elderly grandmother. Both of them said their grandmothers were over a hundred. Who knows how accurate the age record keeping is. 
and that her grandmother favored beef fat over seed oils too. But what did they have on the center of their table? I'm not judging him, but I pointed it out to him. They had white bread, which had seed oils in it, and they had margarine made from seed oils right there on the freaking table. And I was like, Gasper, this is your problem. This is the problem here. It's not the red meat. These are the problems. And you see it. And it's that's really the, in some ways, an epitome of this trip um, and why we went to see it play out. And it was so cool to hear those stories from Gasper about his super centenarian grandmother who was clearly a meat eater. There's your little micro blue zone, right? In Tanzania, these, these two generations ago, his, he and his wife's grandparents were super centenarians or centenarians eating tons of meat and really being aware that this quote flour oil, this, this seed oil is not good for humans. And now there's been a complete shift because the medical establishment is so hyper-focused on LDL I mean, the reason we're scared of animal fat is because it raises LDL in some people. And that's why I've done all the other podcasts about that. I want to take a few minutes and just mention the teeth. I'm sure the maids are going to come in any minute and kick me out of this room, but we'll see. This is real life, guys. So we have lots of photos and video of the Hadza. And if you look at their teeth, you'll see that the structure is really good. But a lot of the teeth are quite brown. And this was really confusing to me. And I think to Anthony too, when we got to Tanzania, in fact, even before we went to see the Hadza, I noticed that at Gasper's school, almost all of the kids had brown stains on the front of their teeth. And when we checked into the hotel at Lake Manyara, the guy working the counter had brown stains on the front of his teeth. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? And then you go to see the Hadza and about 50% of them have some pretty significant brown stains on their teeth. And I'm not a dentist, I didn't look at any mouths, but there's been a lot of research about this and the best thing I could come up with here is that this is fluorosis. And Gasper was kind of aware of this too, that a lot of the water supply in Tanzania has been incorrectly or problematically contaminated with fluoride. And I found a couple of articles, again, we'll link to these in the show notes that, that show this uh, effects of excess fluoride intake. Um, the water was very high in fluoride. A survey undertaken in areas of Tanzania where that water was high showed modeling of the teeth some skeletal fluorotic changes were noted in older people. And they just mentioned here that, um, that much of this land is very high in fluoride and it can cause brown stains on the peat teeth. And so I think a lot of these rivers, as they say here, a lot of these rivers that the Hadza may have had access to may be contaminated with fluoride and that may be causing the brown teeth. So it's unfortunate, but what's interesting was some of the people didn't have it. There must be some genetic thing or maybe they I don't know why some didn't have it and some had it, but there was a lot of browning of the teeth, but the structure was good in the majority of people we saw. Um, was that your sense too? Yeah, straight dentition, strong teeth. Um, another thing that they do way more than they should <laughs> is smoke unfiltered tobacco. Yes. So, yes. Like, I mean, insane. I mean, this is another thing that was fascinating to me. They, If they can, they want to drink, they want to get high, they want to smoke tobacco. And I mean, it just seem, seems like something that's preserved across all humans is the need and want and desire to change the state of consciousness. Um, but they smoke a lot. They smoke a lot of unfiltered tobacco. And so the brown, I think, is a combination of the fluoride, excess fluoride, as well as the amount of unfiltered tobacco that they're smoking. It's it's insane amount. And so they get where do they get that from? Gas, Gasper gives it to them because they love it. Um, uh, I think missionaries bring it and it's just nonstop. They buy it. It's yeah, they buy it and they seek it. I mean, like I said, this isn't perfect. This wasn't a 50,000 year time machine. This is half 50,000 years and half, you know, a hundred years ago. But what do we know about humans? When they can get high, they're going to do it. We like altered states. Um, it, it doesn't, I don't think it diminishes anything about what they're doing or who they are as a people or the beauty of their culture, but it does sort of speak to the, the difficulty of closing Pandora's box once it's been open. Um, Pandora's box once it's been opened, whether that's convenience and processed foods, whether that's tobacco, whether that's uh, marijuana, which they also smoke a lot, whether that's alcohol, because, you know, some of the sad parts of this, I guess maybe we won't necessarily end on a sad note, were that they, that they, that they wanted Ugali, that when I left the tribe, they said, when you come back, you're welcome, but bring us Ugali. And in my mind, I thought, I'm not going to bring you Ugali. I'm going to bring you more arrowheads. We brought them arrowheads and we're gonna try and create something to preserve your lands, but I don't wanna encourage this. So that was very bittersweet for me that they, they're they probably becoming more and more dependent on the Ogali. And they want you to bring them tobacco and ganja. And if you brought them alcohol, which I would never do, they would drink it, 
with, with pleasure. And so this is who we are as humans. It's hard to close Pandora's box. And if you give them candy, they will eat candy. They're not enlightened. Um, and I don't even know, that probably sounds strange. And they're not so, um, they're not gonna shun high value foods. Um, it's just, they're a window to the way that, that we never had access to those in the past. And generally they are pretty healthy. Well, that's the, that's the struggle of, of modern humanity is that we have to fight against all of our programmed genetic needs to reduce energy output and maximize energy input and make those choices on a day-to-day basis in, in the face of just massive, massive opportunity to do so. Yeah. So let's, I just, let's say a few words. So we don't have this fully fleshed out, but like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, Anthony and I have an intention to to return to Tanzania with a group of you guys. We'll be talking about this more um, to really curate a trip that includes a lot of badass hunting with the Hadza and as little touristy shit as possible. Um, and- Yeah, because there, there is a lot of that. If you, if you don't get the, the right intro and the right people to take you and have the connections, you are gonna get the song and dance. We saw many people, we were hanging out eating the baboon, baboon brains <laughs> And these two women with walking sticks come in and like they do a little fire, they do a little song and dance, they take some photos and they leave. And we saw that sort of cycle in and out like a turnstile. And then we were there for five days in a very, very different experience. So my goal is to be able to set this up in a curated way where people can go through and Paul and I can sort of figure out, okay, what's the experience that will get people sort of back to to really figure out what it was like to, to live like a human throughout most of our history and make it so that way you, you can arrive in Tanzania and not worry about a goddamn thing. Because there was a lot of trying to figuring out, for me at least, I don't know if you experienced this, like, oh man, what should I pack? What was gonna happen? What are we gonna do? Or was like, is this ride here gonna happen there? And like Eric did a good job sort of wrangling us together, but I think that it could be streamlined way more. So I would love to set up something for people who are interested where they can have the same experience as us, but even more streamlined. And then all the proceeds that um, obviously don't go to Gasper and his crew and everybody else for wrangling this up, doesn't go to buy the Hadza tobacco, it doesn't go to buy the Hadza Ugali. It goes, I mean, we're figuring out with, with Gasper how we can do this, but helps preserve the Hadza's environment. And that may look like several things. It may look like getting the Toga new land away from the Hadza so that way they can relocate some of their farms and preserve the Hadza's hunting grounds. Maybe it's cleaning up their water supply so they don't consume much excess fluoride. We're, we're still working through a lot of what, what that actually looks like, but creating up some sort of fund where we can try to reestablish and protect their natural habitat. They don't want to enter in modern civilization and you know we want them to be able to live the life that they want to live. Um, so I think that what we'll do is I'll create a form within the next couple of weeks, we'll share it on your social media mailing list, I'll do the same thing. Um, so look out for that and we'll collect as many people all write up sort of like probably what it will entail. And this so we can get some interest to see how many people would want to make this trip to see if it would be worthwhile us planning everything out. But I've gotten lots of feedback of basically like, how the hell can I do this? This is the most incredible thing that, that I didn't even know was an option on the planet. So I want to enable as many people as possible who want to do this the right way and not just spoil their way of living, but preserve it and observe it and, and stay with them. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it right now. I love it. And I think that the key is just protecting their land. We'll probably have to do some political wrangling, um, but we really want to create like a conservation area for them and just try and get the big game there because it would be really cool to just to preserve this culture for future generations. We're, we're just afraid that they're going to be extinct very soon. And there's too much valuable there. And we see it happening uh, in before our eyes. And we're just, I'm, I'm very grateful that they weren't gone when we got, and we got to see it and we learned so much, we're gonna have to do a part two, but let's just wrap this up, Anthony. What are your main takeaways from the trip to the Hadza or to Tanzania in general, because we also saw the Datoga and the Maasai? Yeah, I think that just living a healthy life and living a human life is more by subtra- subtraction than addition. Mm-hmm. Just get back to basics. I mean, that's kind of the big takeaway and what I've been reflecting on the most. What about yourself? I think I agree with you that it that it's nature, that it's animal foods, um, that it's community, that it's play, and it's not complicating things too much. It's it's all quite simple, but there's so much misinformation out there, and I hope that 
that this podcast released on both of our channels will, will be just another beacon of people to counteract all this misinformation because um, there's so much out there. I mean, that's really, that's becoming a big part of why I do what I do. And I think you the same, that there's just, there's so much parroting of incorrect things. People are saying, but isn't meat bad for you? I mean, Gasper thinks red meat causes diabetes and people are commenting on my feed, like, what about the blue zones? And don't they live a short amount of time? And it's all right there. That's why mm -hmm. we did it. You know, we got in the DeLorean, like this is, we did the experiment. We, we did it. You know, we went back in time as best we could and you see it all playing out in front of your eyes and it all becomes crystal freaking clear and all of the bullshit falls away. And I hope that um, we can continue to really dispel the bullshit moving forward by saying, no, that's not how it is. Like we were freaking there. We've seen humans living in the wild and this is the way it looks. This is the way they live. This is what they prioritize. And this is how healthy they are. And pretty sure we can recreate that in our own lives. We don't have to go live in Hadzaland. We don't have to go live in Tanzania or Lake Yasi, but I think with intention, we can do it as best as possible by prioritizing the things that are most important. Yeah. So do you want to collect some more questions between when this podcast comes out, maybe like another week or two, and then we'll do a round two answering people's questions. Yeah, let's do it. We'll do a round two guys. So sounds good. And then again, be on the lookout for the form to see who's interested in making a trip. Um, I also want to figure out how we can make a Bao Bob product. <laughs> it's our secret. <laughs> yeah, this is like the, the Bao Bob food. So it's, it's freaking delicious. I love it. And I'm just trying to think about like how, like, how can we get more support in the Hadza's way? I and mean, if anybody has any ideas, please hit us up. But be on the lookout for, you know, any, any form around going to see the Hadza, but as well, send us any questions you guys have. And we will hopefully answer those in a round two. Yeah, so you can send those to me at Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul at hardandsoil.co. Where is the best place for people to send you questions? Uh, Instagram, inbox, Dr. Anthony Gustin. You want your DMs, man? I forgot to ask. I can't deal with my DMs. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on, brother. All right, Paul. Appreciate it. Wey la pina, Take care. <laughs>